yes everyone yes shiva krishna please confirm whether i am audible and visible in your message So yes, everyone. Shiva Krishna, everyone, please comment in the comment box. I am audible and visible. Then I can start the session. Yes, thank you, thank you, Shiva. So, everyone, first of all, I will be when we got the question paper at 11 30, 11 30 to 1 rigorously, we had very quickly we worked together as a team and we come up with an output. That output first I will be explaining in the format of analysis. UPSC CSC prelims 2022 question paper is in out by 11 30 am, and the understanding is current affairs questions, current affairs, institutions, international events and international organizations. Again, I am repeating current affairs, institutions, international organizations and international events hold together 11 questions were been out, 11 questions were been there. Second, environment and ecology 15 questions, science and technology and general science 14 questions. Indian geography, physical geography and world geography 12 questions, Indian economy exclusive this time economy questions were been asked more, economy related current affairs were been asked, but Indian economy exclude directly economy questions were been there. So, we categorized as Indian economy 21, Indian polity questions were been 12, but two questions are exclusive judiciary point of view, law point of view. But still as Indian polity and constitution, we have to cover it. So, Indian polity 12 questions, Indian history 15 questions. This time medieval India, art and culture, the number of questions were been reduced with respect to history. But this time as every time the UPSC will be giving the shocks, this time UPSC gave the shock with Indian economy. Science and technology also number of questions were been more. I will read out what were the questions. I am discussing about set A. I am discussing about I am discussing about set A. In set A, the economy questions are from 1 to 10, 61 to 69, 71 and 72. In history, it is 52 to 60, 91 to 96. Science and technology and general science 31 to 40, 90, then 97, 98, 99. Then geography we have 21 to 30, 70 comma 81. Environment we have 41 to 50, 75, 80, 84, 89 and 100. Indian polity my subject 11 to 20, 71 comma 73 questions were been there. But see my dear students current affair boleto, current affairs means it is linked with current affairs, institutions like T board they asked about international events and international organizations hold together 11 questions were been there 74, 76, 77, 78, 79, 82, 83, 85, 86, 87, 88. Properly a team of 4 people we sat together and we properly made this. So, this particular distinction, this particular analysis is 98 percent accurate, 98 percent accurate. Current affairs may say 11 questions aya tha. Environment and ecology 15 questions, science and technology and general science together 1 14 questions, science and technology and general science. Geography related, Indian geography, physical geography, world geography we have 12 questions. Indian economy was the googly type of questions this time we have 21 questions we have in economy and Indian polity 12 and Indian history 15. This is the UPSC CSC prelims analysis. So, I cannot come up with the cutoff. 
if I come up with the cutoff, it will be a premature decision by evening by the time we complete our complete key analysis at that time I will be come up with what would be the cutoff. Why? Because this time the cutoff was somewhere around 87.5 according to the UPSC. So, we want more time to come out with the cutoff, but this is the division, the division of the subject, the division of the topics which are been asked in UPSC prelims 2022. And now, I am going to discuss my key paper, my questions of Indian polity. Indian polity may, UPSC, CAC may, what are all the questions were been asked in Indian polity that I will be discussing now. So, set A, in set A, if you can see this particular question, if you see this particular question, 11th question is asked. As I told you, polity questions are from 11 to 20, 51 and 73, this is the 11th question. Yes, geography means world geography, physical geography and Indian geography which I want to mean it. So, coming to the 11th question, consider the following statements pursuant to the report of H N Sanyal, pursuant to the report of H N Sanyal committee, the contempt of courts act 1971 was been passed, 1971 was been passed, one minute, yes, color. So, I hope now you can see, yes. So, this is correct, H N Sanyal committee based upon the H N Sanyal committee report only contempt of act, why this is in the news, 2021 Prashant Bhushan case, every time the contempt of court, one or the other person, one or the other reason it is in the news because of which contempt of court they asked. Second, the constitution of India empowers the Supreme Court and the high courts to punish for contempt of themselves. Yes, this is constitution of India empowers the Supreme Court and High Court to punish for contempt of themselves comes under article 129, direct question, article 129 talks about Supreme Court and High Court have the power to punish themselves if there is any contempt of court. The constitution of India defends civil contempt and criminal contempt, no, constitution of India discussed about contempt, but did not told what is civil contempt and what is criminal contempt? You constitution did not discussed about it. I believe this particular question paper is this time totally elimination model. For example, see here, this is 3 is wrong, the 3 is wrong, so I removed 3 here, I removed 3 here, 3 is wrong, 192, 192 and 4. In India, the parliament is vested with the powers to make laws on contempt of court. See if this question contempt of court act of 1971, this is direct an act, a legislation which is made by the parliament, this is direct an act which is made by the parliament. So, 1, 2 and 4 are correct, 1, 2 and 4 are correct, the constitution of India discussed about contempt, but did not define what is civil contempt, but did not define the criminal contempt, why because scheduled tribe also did not define, scheduled caste also did not define minorities also did not define, backward classes also did not define, similarly contempt of civil, contempt of criminal also did not define, in that way we have to remember, means, means whether they, the constitution has defined or not, they did not define. So, eliminating 3, I came to conclusion 1, 2, 1, 2 are correct, anyhow 4 is, if you see here contempt of court, contempt of courts act 1971 means parliament only made no, so 1, 2 and 4. This is the first answer of Indian polity. Next is coming to, with reference to India, consider the following statements. This is very interesting question. This is very interesting question. Government law officers and legal firms are recognized as advocates. I will tell you the distinction, main distinction. Advocates are those, advocates are those why? Because this is little bit tough question for you as I am an, a practicing advocate at Hyderabad High Court after completion of LLB and now doing LLM, I want to tell you that advocate means who go for an argument in the court of justice is called as advocate. Lawyer means who submit a petition, who write a motion, who submit a petition, who write a motion, who advise is called as lawyer. So, here Recently, in Netflix, one movie was been, one web series was been released, which is called as 
Lincoln lawyer. The Lincoln lawyer, I watched it. The same was been there in that particular Netflix. Means sometimes you have to connect it. If you want, you can see the same. The Lincoln lawyer. There also, the lawyer Lincoln lawyer is an a corporate people. They also give patent. They are not called as advocates. They are called as lawyers. So here, in the twelfth question. Both one and two are correct. Why? Because government law as well as legal firms are only called as advocates, whereas corporate people as well as patent people will be called as lawyers. Bar councils have the power to lay down the rules relating to legal education and recognition of colleges. Yes, true. Mainly, bar council will have a very good say. Bar council will have a very good say with respect to what should what should be the curriculum. They also have the say. So both one and two are correct. Next. Thirteenth question. Thirteenth question. It's about very easy question. Very very easy question. A bill amending the constitution requires a prior recommendation of the president of India. No, prior recommendation of the president only for money bill. Prior recommendation of the president only for money bill as well as for states bifurcations. states reorganization only for that purpose there is a need for prior permission of the president for constitutional amendment bill there is no requirement of president president approval is required mainly when there is money bill as well as when there is states reorganization for example states reorganization act of 2014 which resulted in bifurcation of andhra pradesh resulted in residual andhra pradesh and telangana because of which this is wrong statement wrong statement so 1 1 1 finish answer is 2 and 3 no need to lick a bill amending the constitution requires a prior recommendation of the president of india not required so 1 is wrong here 1 is there here 1 is there so answer is 2 and 3 the next is the constitution of india classified the ministers into four ranks if you see we have three ministers are there in the constitution under article 75 of the constitution under article 75 of the constitution we have three classification three ministers are there one is called as cabinet minister other is called as minister of state that's it minister of state that's it not minister of state with independent charge so this ministry is not there minister of state and deputy minister so it is not the four ranks it is not four ranks it is three ranks it is not four ranks it is three ranks the total number of ministers in the union government includes the prime minister shall not exceed 15% of the total number of members in the lok sabha this is according to this is according to 91st constitutional amendment act this is according to 91st constitutional amendment act 15% of the total number of house members of lok sabha that is 91st constitutional amendment act of 2003 so this is also in the news so answer for 13 is b i told you it is not four ranks constitution told only for three ranks one is cabinet minister other is minister of state and other is deputy minister next is which of the following are exclusive powers of lok sabha which of the following are exclusive powers of lok sabha this is 15th question if you have the pdf in our telegram channel our telegram channel link is there in the description in the telegram channel we posted this question paper you can open it and you can see so which of the following are the exclusive powers of lok sabha first to ratify the declaration of emergency after 44th constitutional amendment act of 1978 lok sabha separately rajya sabha separately they have to pass Lok Sabha separately, Rajya Sabha separately. Not only Lok Sabha. So the first to ratify the declaration of emergency is wrong. So what you do? Elimination. Next you see to pass a motion of no confidence against the Council of Ministers, Lok Sabha only. To impeach the President of India, two houses. So three is wrong. So answer is two only. Fifteenth is B. Fifteenth is B only. So my dear students. from this knowledge please use for the next 2023 prelims that is elimination is the best model elimination is the best model if you see we are eliminating this also we eliminated this also we eliminated this also we eliminated the beauty of the polity paper is we can eliminate and we can get the correct answer the next is 
with reference to anti defection law in india anti defection law is very much in use 10th schedule of the constitution 10th schedule of the constitution resulted in the anti defection anti defection law which mainly talks about the mps or mlas who elect in one political party and jump into another political party then how we can disqualify such people's representative how we can disqualify such people's representative is mentioned in 10th schedule of the constitution anti defection law expected question expected question the law means anti defection law specify that a nominated legislature cannot join any political party within 6 months of being appointed to the house 6th yes till 6 months you don't have any right to jump into any other political party you don't have any right till 6 months he will not have any right to jump into any of the political party according to anti defection law of 10th schedule of the constitution the next is the law does not provide any time frame within which the presiding officer has to decide a defection case this one according to original anti defection law i know that judicial review is the basic structure in the judicial review judgment they told that they fixed some time period for the speaker but here the law here the law we have you have to be very careful they are not asking what is the present status of anti defection law they are just telling that according to the law like according to the original constitution according to the original anti defection law so according to original anti defection law the nominated member doesn't have any right to change the party within the first 6 months number 2 the speaker doesn't have any time frame to decide with respect to disqualification of any people's representative so so the answer of 16th is c both 1 and 2 is both 1 and 2 c both 1 and 2 with reference to anti defection law every year every year i told to it is common thing it's common thing anti defection law exclusively we discussed for one hour why because it's important anti defection law representation of people's act of 1950 representation of people's act of 1951 is very very important and the next question is 17th question you have to you have to understand this you have to understand this 17th question it is about listen carefully upsc is very careful वो लोगों ने ऐसा बना दिया कि क्वेश्चन कि पीपल विल राउंड ट्रिप इन द एग्जामिनेशन हॉल सी हियर अटर्नी जनरल ऑफ इंडिया एंड अटर्नी जनरल ऑफ इंडिया एंड सोलिस्टर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया यू नो दिस बोथ आर लॉ ऑफिसर्स ऑफ द कंट्री दिस बोथ आर लॉ ऑफिसर्स ऑफ द कंट्री वन इज अटर्नी जनरल ऑफ इंडिया अदर इज सोलिस्टर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया आर द ओनली ऑफिसर्स ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट हु आर अलाउड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन द मीटिंग्स ऑफ पार्लियामेंट ऑफ इंडिया whenever there is a word called as whenever there is a word called as only you have to be very very careful you have to be very very careful when there is a word called as only kabhi bhi only if the word is there you have to wait there if only but incorrect such type of questions are there in my classroom also specifically i used to ma- make a note only but correct incorrect so in this particular question attorney general of india and solicitor general of india are the only officers no no comptroller auditor general of india can also sit in the yes meetings of the parliament so this is wrong statement and the second is according to the constitution of india the attorney general of india submits his resignation when the government which appointed him resigns no not at all attorney general of india means highest law officer of the country attorney general of india means highest law officer of the country who will be appointed by the present government so for me for the government there should be one particular advocate who will be advocating for the government for the state so if i am the prime minister i will appoint that advocate who is good so when i resign when i resign it doesn't mean that attorney general of india should also resign no if another government come into existence if they want to continue they can continue it if they don't want to continue then they will ask him to resign then he will resign so it's not compulsory that with the resignation of the ruling government the attorney general of india will be resigned is no so answer this both are wrong statements so neither one nor two neither one nor two yes very good prakriti 
नाइदर वन नार टू होता है इससे हमें नॉलेज मिलता है कि सो वी हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल इट माइट बी अटर्नी जनरल ऑफ इंडिया और इट माइट बी द सोलिसिटर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया येस दे आर द ऑफिसर्स ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया बट हवेवर यहाँ पे क्या है ओनली ए ओनली ए तो इसका मतलब ये हुआ कि दिस आर द नॉट ओनली दिस टू दैट इज अटर्नी जनरल ऑफ इंडिया एंड सोलिसिटर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया कंट्रोलर राइटर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया कैन ऑल्सो सेट linguistic minority officer can also sit so there are other officers also who will be sitting in the parliament and the discussion in the debates but they don't have the power to vote they can sit in the parliamentary proceedings but they don't have the power to vote except to vote they have all the they have, they have the power to come into the parliament and to sit and yahan pe kya hota hai ki attorney general resign karna hai government resign karne se to this is not mandatory so what is mandatory it's according to the wish of the next government whether to continue with the attorney general or not so answer is either one nor two aur ek question hai writs writs are very important article 32 of the constitution talks about writs for the enforcement of the fundamental rights and according to dr b r ambedkar the heart and soul of the constitution is article 32 the fundamental rights can be enforced only with the enforcement of article 32 so compulsory there will be question called as 32 in fundamental rights so expected fundamental rights were been asked now you see mandamus will not lie this lie means power don't think lie truth lie wo lie nahi hai lie power mandamus will not lie against a private organization unless it is entrusted with public duty see here what is mandamus mandamus is nothing but an order given to any officer a order given to any employee on the official capacity as a government officer capacity if he is not performing his duty then it is a mandamus writ which makes sure that yes this government employee should work this government officer should work so if any officer if he is not working if any officer if he is not working then the order will be released that hey why you are not working chalo kaam karo yahan pe that is the mandamus so mandamus will not lie against a private organization unless it is entrusted with public duty as yes, correct statement iska matlab ye hua ki mandamus will not apply on private individual but that private individual is have his doing some work on public authority like giving a contract railway contract railway contract diya aur wo kaam nahi kar raha yes you have got the money the government already released then why you are delaying it i can i can go for mandamus also yes it can be imposed on any private man if any official authority or official work is doing for correct statement second mandamus will not lie against a company even though it may be a government company no if it is a government company mandamus can be imposed so coming to the 18th answer c is the why because two is wrong i eliminated two i eliminated two and i eliminated two see here i eliminated two i eliminated two i eliminated two so bus if i know this if i know this i no need to read this why because in 1 c d in 3 two are wrong so kaha pe two nahi hai c pe two nahi hai so answer is what 1 and 3 1 and 3 no need to look into 3 also now i will not look into 3 also why because i got the answer with the second statement only and the 19th question is this is very interesting government scheme we discussed this government schemes which we did 100% prelims plus navaratnalu bolke humne we had started one program for prelims last week last 10 days we completed this government schemes in this we discussed about this aishman bharat digital mission whereby every individual will be provided with a digital id like how we have aadhar card in the same way there will be a digital id in that digital id my total health profile will be uploaded so if by just entering my digital id health digital id my complete description description of my health related information will be coming out that is envisaged under the scheme called as aishman bharat digital mission so what it talks about consider the following statements private and public hospitals must adopt it true ये खाली गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल के लिए नहीं है दिस इज नॉट जस्ट फॉर गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल इट इज फॉर गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल्स एज वेल एज प्राइवेट हॉस्पिटल्स बोथ आर इन्वॉल्व हियर पब्लिक एज वेल एज प्राइवेट फर्स्ट स्टेटमेंट इज करेक्ट नेक्स्ट इट एम्स टू अचीव यूनिवर्सल हेल्थ कवरेज 
every citizen of india should be part of it ultimately 100% this program is not for below poverty line this program is not for sc st everyone they want to cover the every individual every citizen of the country under this digital health infrastructure so that every individual will be getting a unique health id true correct 192 it has a seamless portability across the country anywhere if i am a migrant labor i got my ayushman bharat digital mission digital id if i got it hyderabad but i went to delhi there my accident happened so i can use this my digital id there also so it's a portability i can use anywhere so hence the statement is yes 1 2 and 3 hence the statement is 1 2 and 3 ayushman bharat digital mission government schemes expected I told to my students compulsory one or two minimum government schemes will be there. यहाँ पे है government scheme. Yes. The next is deputy speaker of Lok Sabha. Very very interesting. Why you know? Why because Maharashtra government is not recruiting speaker and deputy speaker since long. From 2021 से the Maharashtra Assembly is not at all recruiting the speaker as well as the deputy speaker. So this is was a this was a constitutional lag. This was a constitutional crisis. Being a Maharashtra, why you are not appointing a speaker? Who is the presiding officer of Maharashtra Assembly? There is no speaker. There is no deputy speaker. So because of which it is in the current affair. Because of which they asked this question on deputy speaker Maharashtra ke basis pe, with reference to deputy speaker of Lok Sabha, consider the following statement number one: As per the rules of procedure and conduct of business in Lok Sabha. The election of deputy speaker shall be held on such date as the speaker may fix. Yes, correct. The speaker election date will be fixed by president. Deputy speaker election date will be fixed by speaker. Take my word. Speaker election date will be fixed by speaker election date will be fixed by president and deputy speaker election date will be fixed by. speaker so yahan pe kya hua so the deputy speaker election date is fixed by whom the deputy speaker election date is fixed by speaker correct statement so i will eliminate 3 and 4 i will eliminate 2 and 4 now you see 50% by one statement i came to a conclusion 50% either answer will be a or b anyhow c and d is got eliminated i removed this now i will check if i see 2 finish i got answer why because One and three is there, and in B two is there. So two is what which is going to determine the answer. There is a mandatory provision that the election of a candidate as deputy speaker to Lok Sabha shall be from either the principal opposition party or the ruling party. I will tell you. It is not this word is very important. Mandatory provision. Such types compulsory, mandatory, but unless incorrect, correct only. You have to be very careful. Mandatory provision बोल के लिखा है नहीं. By convention, by convention the speaker will become from ruling party. By convention, just they are following लेकिन है convention. By convention from opposition party the deputy speaker is getting elected. It's a convention, not a mandatory provision. So this is wrong. there is a mandatory provision that the election of a candidate as a deputy speaker of lok sabha shall be from either the principal opposition party or ruling party no so cancel answer is a so 20th answer is a finish if you notice by two statements only i am getting the answer so this time i will use for another questions you should also be in a position by how many statements are there four statements are there without reading the third statement without reading the fourth statement we got the answer to it so please 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 my dear students my dear friends so with minimal time we have to get the answer that can happen only by classroom practice so do more practice more practice you can do it the next government of india act of 1919 government of india act of 1919 ए गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एक्ट 1919 में क्या हुआ गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मॉन्टिको चेम्स फॉर रिफॉर्म्स 1909 नॉट नाइन इज कॉल एस मॉर्लीमेंटो रिफॉर्म्स नाइनटीन इज कॉल एस मॉन्टिको चेम्स फॉर रिफॉर्म्स नाइनटीन थर्टी फाइव इज कॉल एस गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एक्ट नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन इज कॉल एस इंडिपेंडेंस इंडिया एक्ट सो द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एक्ट ऑफ नाइनटीन नाइनटीन इट हैज फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम अडॉप्टेड डायर्ची फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम इट अडॉप्टेड डायर्ची 
whereby there will be a reserved subjects as well as transferred subjects. In the government of India act the functions of provincial governments are divided into so provincial governments man now today it is called a state governments there is a provincial governments there is a diarchy at the center there is a diarchy at the provinces according to 1919 government of India remember this according to 1935 government of India the diarchy is there at the center level central government level so diarchy means transfer list and reserve list so reserved and transfer list which of the following were treated as reserved common sense reserved means it will be under the control of governor general transferred means it will be under the control of people's representative it will be under local minister transferred transferred to local minister reserved it will be under the governor general who is the governor general he will be a britisher so see here which of the following were treated as reserved subject leave everything local self government see that governor general he is very much busy a britisher how he will think about the local level local panchayat whether he will have any time to look into the local panchayat at the remote 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 village what is happening in the local self government he doesn't have any time no so obviously he will give it to whom transferred you minister you local people you take care about local self government so if i know this point by common sense also local self government means which whereby in the street level at a village level at a very very remote level where the administration is running how the panchayat raj institutions are working how why a governor general will look into it no no so it will not be in reserved list but it will be in transfer list transfer list means local minister reserved means british officer so local self government i understood local self government is transfer list so what i did local self government to no to no to no two is not there in where c 1 3 and 4 we will see administration of justice yes reserve list land revenue yes police also police who will so british people will take care about the police no so 1 3 and 4 so local administration was been under the transfer list rest all land revenue police administration of justice was under the control of next question next <coughs> next is 73 directly 73 directly 73 see my my subject anthropology if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution you know two schedules are there in the constitution which mainly talks about uh, tribes fifth schedule and sixth schedule fifth schedule and sixth schedule the other name for fifth schedule is called as schedule area the other name for sixth schedule is called as tribal area fifth schedule and sixth schedule so if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution of india which one of the following statements best reflect the consequence of it remember this how i will eliminate first this would convert that area into a union territory no no any any schedule 5 is about schedule areas mean tribal areas it doesn't it, it schedule areas mainly tribal people who are living in mainstream india this is india yes a rough diagram the tribal people who are living in this mainstream india in the forest areas are called as schedule areas the tribal people who are living in northeast india are called as tribal areas so the tribal people living in northeast india and their areas are called as tribal areas the tribal people living in mainstream india and the tribal areas are called as schedule areas are called as schedule areas so now i want to tell you that this would convert that area into unit no the state having such areas would be declared a special category state no this would prevent the transfer of land of tribal land or tribal people to non tribal people this would create a local self government body in that area that is by pisa act 1996 that is local self government or local self governing body in that area which is pisa act panchayati raj extension to schedule areas 1996 act it is not scheduled 5 whereas schedule 5 is mainly about protection of the tribal lands to not to transfer to non tribals is the main protection with respect to scheduled five areas so answer is a
So, the answer is A, 73 answer is A, yes. So, this is the end of polity. Now, geography sir will come up, sorry, uh, economy, yes, economy sir, Spuran Reddy sir will come up, he will be discussing more number of questions are there. So, sir, So, I believe that the question paper, the key is 98 percent accurate. So, if little bit errors are obviously not there, we have we had searched a lot, but how what should what will be the cutoff? At the end of the session, I will be declaring what will be the cutoff. Okay. Hmm? Okay. So, please everyone be live, the SAR will join you within 10 minutes. The P, the key paper is getting ready. All right. So, uh, hello everyone. So, I hope you have all gone through the questions. Uh, hi, Navid. Yeah. So, let's start our. Uh, let's start with our first question. Or we can do a mix and match. I generally don't prefer to go with the first question onwards, so it's better to go with. So, if you look at the weightage, last year I think it was around 15 questions, it was only about 15 questions, whereas this year we have around 21 questions. So, yes, obviously the weightage has increased for good or bad, for good of course, economy it's easier to score relatively, relatively. So, let's see. As I said, like let's come back from the last. That will be a little easier. So yeah. In India, what is the role of coal controllers organization? So this is not exactly from economy, but you can say that it's from economy in the sense that there has been a coal crisis. As all of you must have been aware, there was a coal crisis. So, to avert the coal crisis, the government of India has taken many steps, one stop step. In fact, this coal control organization, this is not any one you know, random question actually. You might be, some of you might be wondering, so what to, like how can we read about such uh, organizations which are not generally known to us, known to people. No one really knows about this. If not for the coal crisis, this wouldn't even have been in the news. But what the government did was it has opened a sub office of the CCO, the Coal Controllers Organization, and there was also a coal crisis. So it's more of a current affairs related question that has a bearing on the economy, right? So if we look at the options, and again, there are like four options, it's better to go with an exclusion criteria in such type of questions. So if you look at the options, CCO is the major source of coal statics in government of India. Yes with a decent current affairs knowledge, you can say that this is the case. Then it monitors and progresses the development of captive coal lignite blocks. Keep that option aside. Then it hears any objection to government's notification relating to acquisition of coal bearing areas. Again, subjective question. I'm just trying to help you in excluding. Let's go with exclusion criteria. If it works, then it will be easier or else then we will go to the next type of kind of solving of the question. Then it ensures that coal mining companies deliver the coal to the end users in prescribed time. Yes, or you, you do not have to do anything about this, you just have to open the responsibilities of CCO, that is the only source. So, if you look at the responsibilities of only uh, CCO, yes, one responsibility is that it is an educated adjudicating body. If there are any conflicts between the producers and the consumers, final consumer, then this body will adjudicate. So, in that sense, yes, it ensures that coal mining is delivered the coal in the prescribed time. So, one of the condition is like delivering the contract. So, yes, one and four. So, choose, see which options are having one and four. Okay. So, one, one, one. So, it is not helping us. This one and four is not helping us. So, better go for the third option. The responsibilities generally says that it is only after the allocation of the coal blocks, that is when the CCO comes into pictures. If you just go through, even this is not any direct, uh, there, there is no direct point related to this. 
So, but if you go through the responsibilities, it is after the allocation. So, the allocation part, you, at least you must be aware of the fact that allocation or the coal auctions and coal allocations generally happens on the government side. And if there is any dispute, generally they go to the courts, right? So, or the government cancels the allocations, then the government can, uh, allows the auction one more time. But it's not the CCO. So, you can exclude the third option on the criteria that generally CCO comes into picture after the allocation of the block. So, it, what is this saying? It hears any objection to the government's notification relating to the acquisition of coal bearing areas. So, simply simplify the statement. It means that the statement is saying that CCO is the adjudicating body if you have any problem with government's allocation of the coal box, which is not true, right? Generally, it's the judiciary which will adjudicate, not the executive body like CCO. So, you can exclude number three. And number two, it monitors the progress and development of captive coal and lignite blocks. Again, it's not a direct responsibility of the coal controllers organization, but one of the responsibilities says that CCO has the responsibility to oversee the development of generic coal blocks. Generally, coal blocks, once it is allocated, it has a responsibility. It has to make sure that the developer, whoever is developing the coal block, he will take care of the block, he will develop the block. So, in that sense, this is an application, extended responsibility of that responsibility of CCO. So, cut short the entire story. The idea is that exclude three. Three, three. So, if you exclude three, then you have one, two, and four. So, I will go for one, two, and four. But, some people might say that, okay, it's not about coal and uh, lignite blocks. And as you know, captive coal blocks, what are captive mines? Captive mines are, captive mines are, I, I, I did not give you the answer yet. I'm saying that answer can be in between 1, 2 and 4 and 1 and 2 only. So, because 3 can be excluded. What are captive blocks? Captive mines or captive blocks? Captive mining is a phenomena where if there is a huge power consumer, if there is a huge power consumer or power plants themselves, rather than going from going into the market to buy coal, these industries, it can be a power producer or it can be other industries like cement industry or you know some other industry, steel industry, they will be provided dedicated blocks the steel industry and cement industry, they will be given dedicated blocks to the industry. And what can they do? They can do their own mining, use the coal that they are mining. They don't have to go to the market. In that way, it is easy for them to reduce the market shocks. So, in that sense, captive mines, some people might say that you know it doesn't include captive coal because captive coal is a coal block that is given to these guys so they can do whatever they want but if you ask me if we go straightforwardly of course this is not this can't be the answer so the op the answer uh, if you exclude that if you exclude that because that on the rationale that captive coal there can't be any interference if you exclude that there is no option which means the answer will be 1, 2, and 4. So, to cut short the discussion, this is something which has come up. This is like an extended application part of the responsibilities. So, the only thing that you can exclude from this is the third option, which is it is not the adjudicating body between the disputes of government and any person who is contesting the coal block allocations. So, exclude three, these two options are gone and uh, there will be two options, one and two and one, two and four only. So, of them, one, two and four looks the sure, uh, closest because four is one of the main responsibilities. You have to include four. So, on that way basis, it is one, two and four. Then let us move on to the next question. In India, which one of the following compiles information on industrial disputes, closures, retrenchments and layoffs in factories employing workers? Again, why was this asked? Labor code. Labor laws, all the labor laws, many labor laws have been consolidated into four labor code. Right, there is a wage code, security code, physical safety and working conditions, social safety. So, the government has come up with four laws for codes 
What is a code? A code is a set of laws. That's the only difference. So government has come up with that. So it was in news frequently because the act has the acts have been passed, but they haven't been notified yet. So it was in that context. So it has been in news in the past two to three years. So again, if you look at the question, straightforward, a factual based question. There is no concept involved in it, no economy concept. So if you look at, but if you can just use, just use. It's, it's not that you know it will be correct all the times. But if you can use just our normal general knowledge that we have, it is talking about all labor, industrial disputes, closures, retrenchments, layoffs. So it is talking about the labor. So with that logic, I'm not saying it will work all the time. It is generally the labor bureau which will take care of such type of statistics because conflict between the management and labor, every issue related with labor, it's a labor bureau under Ministry of Labor which will take care of it. So the answer is labor bureau. Then 69, this is, can say it's an SNT question and also an economy related question. We can say that there's nothing wrong in it. So if you look at this, it's purely in current affairs, a new phenomena after Web 3.0. There's a question on Web 3.0 in current affairs, if you have seen. So NFTs are also something related with it. It's a new type of application, right? So it has been in news. So what are these NFTs or non-fungible tokens? Simply the idea is that I have this remote, right? So I can create a digital image of this remote and that digital image can be logged, can be mapped to the physical asset, the underlying physical asset. So rather than selling and reselling the physical asset all the time, you can use this NFT and treat it as good as your physical asset. So that's what the first statement is saying. They enable the digital representation of physical assets. That's what NFT is. In fact, it is a physical asset and also a digital asset. It is a physical asset and a digital asset as well. So number one, then they are unique cryptographic tokens that exist on a blockchain. Yes, that's correct. Blockchain is the underlying technology for NFTs. Then they can be traded or exchanged at equivalency and therefore can be used as a medium of commercial transactions. Yes, every NFT, it's just like, you know, it determines its own value. It's like if I create an NFT, means a digital file. It's just like, imagine that is a, there is an image, just the JPEGs that we use in our day-to-day -day life, that can be like an NFT. But the only thing is that who is owning the original version of the JPEG file. So that will be stored on blockchain. So whenever the ownership is changing, that will be stored. So NFTs have many advantages. One of the main advantage is that if we somehow relate it to economy, the advantage is that you don't have to use the physical asset every time you are doing a uh, sale and resale. Physical asset can be kept in a vault somewhere and the NFT that is mapped to this physical asset, that will change the ownership. So if someone wants to take a possession, then you can go and take a possession. But until then, it will be kept in a vault somewhere. Generally, this is done for the sake of avoiding paying higher taxes. That's the only reason. Most certain, the rich people use this. So it has been in use most, uh, very much. So it was the, that's the reason it has been asked. So yeah, and the advantage of NFT is that you can use NFT just like a cryptocurrency, like a cryptocurrency, both of them are not the same. So NFTs can also be used for a medium of, as a medium of exchange. Then, so what will be the answer? The answer will be one, two, and three. Okay, so please use other colors, yellow color is invisible. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. You want me to change the color? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll use the red. So yeah, answer is one, two, and three. Then in India, very straightforward question. See, if you have looked at the question paper, there is one trend that they have touched up. Last one, one and a half year, the question has been the you know, topics or the main economic theme that has been running in our country has been macroeconomic stability. Why? Because to fight 
COVID, many countries have gone for quantitative easing measures to fight for COVID. To fight with COVID, many countries have gone with quantitative easing measures. Hence, what has happened? There has been quantitative easing, easy money, but because of that, inflation has risen. Because of that, many macroeconomic challenges, reconstructing the economy from the shock of COVID has also been a challenge. All that more for developing countries and underdeveloped countries like India and other poorer countries. So that has been the theme. UPSC has focused on that theme, actually. And uh, if, you, if you look at the questions, Without newspaper reading, this, it's a bit difficult to answer these questions because most of them are not. If you have seen just now, we have, what did you do? We have answered this question. We said that it is 1, 2 and 4. Without newspaper, we can't know one, we, we don't really know. Then likewise, this question, newspaper. This is relatively straightforward question, right? I want any one of you to answer yes yes rahul rahul chaudhary yeah it's a pretty straightforward question right if you have uh, if you have been done with the classes then you will be knowing i was looking for in fact when i was looking at the options i was checking for option of mpc had there been mpc mpc is the best choice but yes in india which one of the following is responsible for maintaining price stability by controlling inflation of course it is your reserve bank of india d yes Answer is D. Why? Because we have monetary policy framework agreement or nothing but that is inflation targeting. Under that we have established MPC. Under that 4 plus or minus 2% of buffer. 4% is the targeted inflation rate. All the story you must be knowing by now. Right? So inflation again. Why was this asked? A macroeconomic question. Inflation is a macroeconomic point. Macroeconomic variable. Because of quantitative easing. There was a lot of easy money in the economy. All of the sudden things because there is easy money. Easy money means money at relatively cheaper interest rates. When the money is available at cheaper interest rates, many people will go and borrow. They will spend thereby increasing the money in the economy, money supply in the economy, thereby increasing the demand of the goods. If the demand increases, price increases. So, yes, it's, it's, it, that's... If, if we connect why this particular question was asked, you can say that. Then, 67, again, no economy textbook, no class will discuss such type of questions. It's impossible. If someone, if someone is claiming that, okay, this question appeared from our classroom discussion, it means that something is, something is, it, it, it means that, uh, let them claim, but it's difficult, right? No economy class will discuss about a particular country. But where will you find this such type? How will you be able to answer such type of questions by newspaper? Of course, right? So the question is not on Vietnam. Of course, the question is on Vietnam. But it is more of an econ-related question because India is competing. What is the larger theme behind this question? India, we are expecting, we are assuming that as part of the reset of global supply chains in the world, many MNCs are going for something called as China plus one strategy. I was expecting a question on China plus one strategy. In fact, this is kind of China plus one strategy. What is China plus one? Most of you, some of you must have come across this. So China plus one is MNCs. All right now, China is a manufacturing powerhouse of the world. So. MNCs, because of COVID, it originated in uh, China and because of the lockdowns and because they are relying only on one country for their products. So all their plants have gone awry. So problem is that they couldn't manufacture. So now they want to diversify their investments, diversify the company's base. So they want to come out of India. So they want, it's not that they are pulling out entire money. There's nothing like that. Yes, some, some people or, you know, our WhatsApp groups, they may say, China is gone, China is gone. No, they're not doing that. They are only saying, thinking of diversification of their manufacturing base. Who? MNCs. As that particular strategy where they want to diversify, not just depend upon China, is known as China plus one strategy. That's number one. So the general assumption is that after China, 
an equally big country is India. So India can benefit a lot from this China plus one strategy. That was the idea. It was there where India is finding a rude shock. Rather than coming to India, other countries, particularly Vietnam, smaller countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico, to an extent, these countries are attracting better capital, Brazil to that, in that matter. These countries are attracting better capital. Of all these smaller countries, Vietnam. Vietnam has been you know, competing with, China, uh, with India in terms of attracting foreign investment. In, in fact, uh, for that matter, of Bangladesh, our very own neighboring Bangladesh is also competing. And it has, you must have read newspaper reports already, that it has already exceeded in terms of per capita income. So the question, larger theme was China plus one strategy. Uh, current affairs because of increase in inflation. Yes, yes, Rahul, exactly, yes. Most of, as I said, most of them are current affairs related and without newspaper, a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult to answer most of the questions. For example, right now it's, it's in front of you. So let's get back to the question. That was the background because of which the question was asked. That because India is competing with Vietnam and Vietnam is winning in terms of attracting the investments. As part of the diversification of global MNCs, in the, as part of China plus one strategy. So look at it, Vietnam has been one of the fastest growing economies in the world in recent years. Yes, of course, Vietnam is the fastest growing country. Then Vietnam is led by a multi-party political system. As I said, not straightforward question. You need to understand, you need to know about, at least you need to have some kind of interest in world affairs. Only then you will be able to know that this particular question is wrong. No, that particular statement is wrong. Why? Because Vietnam follows a single party system. It's just like China. It's a communist socialist nation. So it, China and Russia. So it follows a single party system. How will you know that? Newspaper again. Two is wrong. So one A goes and D goes. You are left with only B and C. So of B and C, see, don't do a mistake of just because one is correct, don't just go for C. Because sometimes there is no guarantee, there is no rule that all correct statements should be included in the answer. There is no rule that all correct statements should be included in the answer. Because I'm saying that 3 and 4, something can be also wrong with 3 and 4. And you can be only left with 3 and 5. So don't think that all statements should be included in the options that are given. Sometimes they can exclude one correct statement also. So let's get on to the... Third statement, Vietnam's economic growth is linked to its integration with global supply chains and focus on exports. Of course, Vietnam is a very small country. In spite of being a small country, in spite of being a very small economy, if it is growing, if it is rapidly growing, it is growing because of exports, not because of consumption. So it is exports-led growth, not consumption-led growth. So yes, of course, and as I said just now, it is cashing in, it is harnessing the advantage of China plus one strategy. Why? Because global supply chains, it has already been integrated into global supply. Global supply chain means what? For manufacturing this particular screen, let's say. It requires what? It requires many things. It requires many shapes. It requires a screen. It requires uh, the metal, the, the whatever the material that has been made with. So each country can provide some, each of these raw materials and all of them can be assembled in Vietnam. That is known as being part of global supply chain. So cut off one link, everything collapses. So yes, Vietnam, economic growth is linked to its integration with global supply chains and focus on exports, yes. Then, for a long time, Vietnam's low labor costs and stable exchange rates have attracted global manufacturers, yes. Yes, if you know about Vietnam's story, we will know that. That Vietnam is a poor country, it's an underdeveloped country. It is, it is lower than uh, India in terms of uh, size, per capita income, and other many economic indicators at one point of time. So it was able to grow and all the developing countries, you must have uh, read by now, right? So all the developing countries, they will be having advantage of low labor costs. And of course, Vietnam, since it is a one party rule, there is no market system. So they can put their exchange rates very stable, pegged or fixed exchange rate systems. So they can follow fixed exchange rate systems. That's what China also does more or less, right? So. Four is also correct. And the last statement, if you look at it, 
Vietnam has the most productive e-services sector in the Indo-Pacific region. Again, you must know about the story of Vietnam, always this question, better to leave such type of questions. Vietnam is a country based on, its economy is based on manufacturing, not services. Countries like India, we are services based. Vietnam is not e-services, basically what do you mean by e-service sector? ICT, nothing but ICT, information and communication technology. So they are asking about, they are say, the statement is saying that Vietnam is based on services sector growth. No, it is manufacturing sector growth. So your five option is wrong. Take out option B, option will be C. So the answer will be option three. One, three and four. One, three and four. That is the answer for this question. Then, Again, a factual question, not really an economic question, but AIB, India is a founding member of AIB, right? MTCR, it is a group which controls the export and the usage of technology related to missile development, right? So it regulates the sharing of technology, MTCR and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So if you have been, it's a question on international groupings, right? So it will be one or two questions on international groupings every year. As part of that, it has been asked. So and uh, you must know that it is D, one, two, three. India is part of, you can just give answers, okay? Whenever like you, if you know the questions, answers to the question, just give them. So this is a, a purely factual question, AIB, MTCR, and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Then, convertible bonds, consider the following statements. Again, as I said, macroeconomic stability, right? So macroeconomic stability has been the theme this year of the focus of the government. So macroeconomic stability, so it is talking about bonds, markets. Questions were expected from capital markets. It was obviously expected. So bonds, interest rates, all those such type of questions. So con with reference to the convertible bonds, consider the following statements. As you know, you know the concept of a bond, face value, coupon rate and all the such things, right? Convertible, the word convertible means what is a bond? Bond is a debt market instrument or it is a debt instrument, right? Equity, shares, normally shares are equity instruments. Bonds are debt instruments. There are two ways of raising funds. One is through equity instruments and the second one is through debt instruments. Bond is a debt. What is a bond? Just like if I give you some money, sorry, if I need some money, if you are giving me some money, let's say one lakh, I'll give you a bond saying that, okay, okay, this is the principle, this is the interest rate, this is the time period in which I'm going to return. And what is the duration of the interest payments? What is the frequency of interest payments? These are the things that uh, you'll read. You must have read, some of you, and some of you will read later on, don't worry. So bond is a debt market instrument, right? Convertible means, the very word means that you can convert this debt market instrument, means you can convert the bond into equity instrument in the meaning that you can convert into a share. Such type of bonds are known as convertible bonds. The idea is that, let's say whenever you are buying a bond, it can say that, okay, we will be, it is a convertible bond. It is convertible at a ratio of 5 to 1. It means that every convertible bond that you are holding will be converted into 5 shares of the company. It will be converted into 5 shares of the company. That's what, converting a bond that is debt instrument into the shares of the company which are equity instruments. That is a convertible bond. So now look at the statements. What are the statements? As there is an option to exchange the bond for equity, convertible bonds pay a lower rate of interest. True, it's true. Convertible bonds, they generally pay lower rate. Why? Because, see, what's the, why will you go for, when will you go for buying a share of a company when you think that the company has better prospects, when you think that the company's price can appreciate a lot, right? So it is in that, that's when you go. Whereas a bond will give you a fixed in return. That's why bond is also called as a fixed fixed income securities. Why? Because your interest rate is fixed. Whereas buy a share, as the value appreciates, as the value appreciates, of the share appreciates, your investment, your capital will also appreciate. 
So you have being uh, you are being given that option. Come to a regular bond, regular bond. No, you won't get even in spite of the company performing exceptionally well. You will be only given what you have been promised at the time of the purchase of the bond. That is the idea. So obviously, whenever a convertible bond is offered, they will pay you a lower rate of interest than the ordinary bonds. Than the ordinary bonds. Yeah, Navid. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Than the ordinary bonds. So it makes sense, correct? Then there is a concept of inflation indexing. There is another question actually, in fact, on this inflation indexing. So, what is the idea of inflation indexing? Inflation indexing is to protect your investment from the protection of from the protection against the inflation. Inflation will decrease the value of your money. So under the concept of inflation indexing, what will be done? The principal, the face value of a bond, whatever the face value of a bond, here this face value, let's say it is 1000 rupees. Based upon inflation, your face value of the bond will keep on changing. Of course, real rate of interest, inflation rate and interest rate, they'll consider that. So what means that? So if there is inflation, let's say, if there is 3% of inflation, then what for the calculation of the, for the purpose of calculation of interest, this 1000 may become 1003, depends. Then any interest, whatever the interest that is offered, 5% is calculated on this. Next year or next month, whenever the next interest payment is due, let's say that inflation has reduced to 2%, then your 1003 will be reduced. That is the idea of inflation indexing. Inflation indexing bonds or IIBs. The question is there in our, in our same paper. We'll see that. So inflation indexing is concept where you want to protect your, infl your, your uh, principal, the money that you have invested against the shocks of inflation. Don't think that, sir, what you may ask, sir, what if the inflation rate is very low or if there is deflation? Will they reduce it below 1,000? No, no, no. They won't do that. They'll only help you by adjusting it to the inflation rate. In, in cases where this goes, the, where the inflation falls very low, and if it goes in deflation environment, no, they won't reduce it below 1000 because they have already paid, the, paid them 1000. So 1000 will be like that. So come back to the statement. The option to convert to equity affords the bondholder a degree of indexation to rising consumer prices. Consumer prices means inflation. So in the case of a normal scenario, normal bond, if the inflation rises, your value of money falls. So there is no protection. Whereas if you think that your inflation has risen a lot and whatever the principle, the face value of the bond, that face value has reduced considerably. What can you do now? You can go and buy, convert the bond into shares under the expectation that the shares of the company might anticipate and bring you capital gains. So the statement that the option to convert to equity affords the bondholder a degree of indexation. It is not saying that by default convertible bonds have indexation. No, it is not saying. It is just saying that if I am the holder of convertible bond, I can assume this thing, right? So it is giving me an option. The option to convert affords the bondholder a degree of indexation to the rising consumer prices. Yes, it gives me a choice. So hence, both of them are correct. So answer is C. See, you need to have the idea of bonds. Without bonds, you can't answer this question. Without the how the bonds work, it's difficult to answer this question. Okay? So with reference to the Banks Board Bureau, yes, it's a very old topic, Banks Board Bureau, as part of Mission Indra Danish. You will read this. Why Mission Indra Danish? To help banks to meet the rising problems of NPA, right? So look at it. Uh, the governor of RBI is the chairman of BBB. Absolutely wrong statement because why? BBB will have his its own chairman. It's not the governor of RBI. The government of India appoints the chairman of the BBB. So the first statement itself is wrong. Exclusion criteria. Exclude three options. Your answer is B, 2 and 3. So if you know that this is wrong. So, but Let's look at the other options also. BBB recommends for the selection of the heads of public sector bank. Yes, this is, in fact, the BBB itself was formed as part of 
PJ Nayak committee recommendation. So PJ Nayak committee recommended this. So BBB, it recommends for the selection of heads of public sector banks. True, all the heads of the public sector banks, they are, uh, they are recommended by the Banks Board uh, Bureau. Then BBB helps the public sector banks in developing strategies and capital raising plans. Yes, one of the responsibilities of BBB is also to help the banks to raise funds to do good lending practices. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward question. It's a very easy question. So B2 and 3. It's like, you know, a feel-good question of always, you know, after giving so many interpretative questions, UPSC also gives these filler, feel-good questions. Then, credit rating agencies, yes, this has been expected because your economic survey has spoken about this. It was not a surprise question. So your economic survey has spoken about this, uh, your, your government has spoken about this. In fact, economic survey talks about the government starting its own credit rating agency. What is a credit rating agency? Credit rating agency is if I'm a company, when I want to raise some credit, if I want to borrow, a credit rating agency, I'll ask a credit rating agency to give ratings to the bonds, to type of bonds or to type of instruments that I am issuing. So it, they'll give you different types of rating, A, AA, AAA, A plus. So there will be different uh, notations. They just say that whether I have the repayment ability to the loans that I am going to take. So that's the job of credit rating agencies. So credit rating agencies give ratings to companies and also to countries. Sovereign debt means whatever the country is borrowing, government is borrowing, that's called as sovereign debt. So sovereign debt is also rated by these credit rating agencies. Why was it in use? Because India is not being given a better credit rating by these international credit rating agencies. There are big four credit rating agencies. What are the big four? If you know the answer, type, the, type in the comment section. Or else just go back and see. So these big four, they are not in giving a better credit rating. What is the advantage if you get the better credit rating agency? You can borrow at lower interest rates. That's the main advantage. You can borrow at the at a lower interest rates. Obviously, right? If someone, if I have a good ability to repay back, if it is, if there is no risk, I'll ask for lower interest rates. So security is there. It was in this context that the question has been asked. Now look at in India, credit rating agencies are regulated by RBI. If you know this, you'll know this. It is not regulated by RBI, but rather it is regulated by SEBI. So remove one, two and three is the option. Two and three is the answer. So, but we'll look at other questions also. Rating agency popularly known as ICRA is a public. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Just a second. In India credit rating agencies are regulated by Reserve Bank of India. No, this is wrong. This is wrong because it should be SEBI, then the rating agency popularly known as ICRA is a public limited company. As far as I know, ICRA is a private company. Yeah, this was one question which, so they are asking you which of the following statements given above are correct. Yeah, I haven't uh, noticed this question properly. One thing is for sure, they are regulated by SEBI actually, not RBI. That, that is for sure. Because RBI, they will just get uh, registered with RBI, but they don't regulate. So it's SEBI which regulates the credit rating agencies. Brickwork ratings is an Indian credit rating. Yes, this is an Indian credit rating agency. So the rating agency, but there is no answer, which means this is for sure wrong. So the answer will be 2 and 3. Public limited company. Okay, it is a public limited company. ICRA is a public limited company. Yes, yes. Then the second statement will be correct. I read it as public listed company. Two and three. The answer is two and three. Yeah, it's not listed. It is a public limited company. So uh, two and three is the answer. Even if you don't know two and three, that two and three are the correct statements. You can, you should know that they are regulated by SEBI. So this is wrong only option that remains is B. See this statement, brickwork ratings, you can't know such type of things. Impossible. 
don't even try to read such type of things because it's a small company which is based in uh, Bangalore. So no one really knows that whether it's a company, but the, by going uh, with the name of the company, it sounds very American or very uh, non-Indian. But it is a, it is established by an IAS officer, an ex-IAS officer, retired IAS officer. But anyhow, so rating agency popular known as Zikra is a public limited company. So two and three are the options, and so B is your answer. Then it's more of a geography question. You'll read it in economic geography, but we'll try to answer it. Uh, Pre-producing states. There are major pre-producing states and minor pre-producing states. Major states are Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, and minor states Andhra Pradesh and Tripura. Yes, to an extent, Andhra Pradesh and Tripura also have T. So the answer is all the four states. Mainly, it's uh, Kerala, uh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka to an extent, Himachal Pradesh, and you also have. Andhra Pradesh, Tripura, there are many other minor states as well. Then again, macroeconomic question, very good question. Let's figure out this question. Tight monetary policy. What do you mean by tight monetary policy? Interest rates are increasing in US. Interest rates are increasing in US. So if US Fed Reserve is increasing interest rates there, People who have borrowed earlier at a cheaper interest rates, now what will they do? They will just take out the money from emerging markets like India. So initially interest rates were low, they borrowed, they wanted to invest in India, take the returns, go back. But now that interest rates are increasing, they have to pay back the money. So now what will they do? They will sell off all their assets in India, in Indian markets and they'll take away the money. Such phenomena is known as capital flight. Capital flight means capital leaving the country. Foreign investors taking out their money and leaving the country. That is capital flight number one. So yes, if interest rates in the US are increasing, there will be capital flight in India, correct? Then second, so one should be there. Second, capital flight may increase the interest rate Interest cost of firms with existing external commercial borrowings. Of course, it can happen. What are external commercial borrowings? When a company borrows in a capital, in, in a foreign country, let's say Indian company has borrowed from US, right? So they have borrowed already when the interest rates are lower. So now they are, what are they trying to do? They are, uh, now the interest rates are increasing. So if the interest rates are increasing, of course, the interest payments that you have to make on the external commercial borrowings, they will also increase. Because most of the time, they are not fixed interest rates. Most of the time, they will be linked. So capital flight may increase the interest cost of firms with existing external commercial borrowings. Yes, possible. So two. And third one is, see, what is capital flight? Foreign investors dumping their rupees. Foreign investors dumping their rupees, meaning the supply of rupee in the markets will increase. They are foreigners. So they will get rid of the rupees. They will buy dollars from the market. They have to go back to their country. So everyone is dumping rupee. So supply of rupee increases. If supply of a product increases, the price of the product falls. Hence, so when rupee the quantity of rupees in the markets increase, the value decreases, which means it is depreciating. When the government does it, it's called as devaluation. The effect impact is the same. So when the government devalues, so what will happen? What are ECBs? ECBs are you borrow in a foreign currency, let's say dollar. Indian company for borrowing in a foreign country, in dollar, let's say, they bring those dollars into India, sell the dollars, take rupees from the market, invest in their companies because Indian company has to deal with only rupees. So they will do this. But whenever they have to pay back this loan, what should they do? They will also again now they will use rupees, buy dollars from the market. But now the government has decreased the devaluation or decrease the value of the currency. So what will happen when currency is devalued? Go back. General, generally what happens? Your exports become cheaper. Means exports increases and imports decrease. Exports increase and imports 
decrease when a country devalues, when a, current, when a country goes for devaluation. So ECBs, what are ECBs? If you have to pay back ECBs, you have to pay back in the form of dollars only. Just see, think that whenever these ECBs, they have to pay back, they have to pay back in dollars. Meaning, now they have to buy dollars. Devaluation means 1 rupee, if it is 50 rupees earlier, after devaluation it becomes 75 rupees. Sorry, 1 dollar. 1 dollar, earlier it was 50 rupees, now it becomes 75 rupees. That is devaluation. So now if I have to buy a dollar now, now I have to spend 75 rupees. Which means, earlier if I have to pay back my ECB, my expenses are increasing now. I need more number of rupees for buying the same amount of dollars that I have borrowed through the ECB. Hence, it is a loss for me. And why did this loss occur? Because of the devaluation. So devaluation of domestic currency decreases the currency risk associated with ECBs. No, this statement is wrong. Why my risk has increased? Now when I brought the ECB, I may have got just 50 rupees. I got $1 as my loan. Back then when I converted, I only got 50 rupees. Now when I have to pay back, I need to spend 75 rupees. So my risk related to the currency exchange rates has increased. It hasn't decreased. Now I am in loss. Always remember, ECBs, you, break, you get dollars and when you have to pay back, you have to pay back in the same currency that you have got the loan in. So your third statement is wrong. Answer will be 1 and 2 only. Answer will be 1 and 2 only. Then, consider the difference of Indian economy. Right. So, if you know the link between savings and uh, how savings turn into investment, there is a link of credit here. Credit is nothing but borrowings. So it is a question related to this. This is a very basic concept related question, very easy question as well. So a share of the household financial savings goes towards government borrowings. Yes, our savings, whenever we are putting money in our markets, uh, sorry, in our banks, a part of them, banks go and you know, they buy government bonds whenever the government is issuing bonds, that is borrowing. So it is indirectly the share of the household financial savings going towards government borrowings, right? So even if you don't know that, savings will become a credit of a next cycle. This credit increases, investment increases. So credit is nothing but borrowing. Someone, the private sector can borrow, government can borrow. So part of the household savings are being turned into, converted into government borrowings, number one, correct. Then debt, generally public debt is classified as internal debt and external debt. Public debt is classified as internal debt and external debt. External debt is borrowing from outside the country. Most of the external debt belongs to the private sector. Around 80% of external debt belongs to private sector, whereas 90% of internal debt belongs to the government. Why government borrows through many ways? Government borrows through many ways. So what is the statement saying? Dated securities. What are dated securities which have a maturity of greater than one year? Bonds. Long term securities generally are known as dated securities. Whereas short term are known as treasury bills. So dated securities or government bonds which generally have a uh, expiry. Which generally have a uh, expiry of five years or ten years. So those are dated securities. Means long term bonds of the government. Dated securities issued at market related rates in auctions form a large components of the internal debt. Yes, we are already saying that 90% of internal debt is by the government, which means generally it's your dated securities which occupy the large portion of your internal debt. So the answer is C, both 1 and 2. Again, this is your economic survey has given this uh, such type of explanation that one question which comes from economic survey is this but if you have been following newspaper very religiously this question is answerable there uh, good afternoon 
Kalua Singh. Nice meeting you. So, with reference to expenditure made by an organization or a company, which of the following statements are correct? Acquiring of new technology is capital expenditure. Yes, correct. It is capital expenditure. <sighs> Acquiring of new technology is capital expenditure. Then, second one, debt financing. See, there are two things when it comes to expenditure of companies. Debt financing is opposite to equity financing is opposite to equity financing. What is equity financing? When you are starting the company, you issue shares, right? The first starting point of the company, however, how will it start? Each one of us bring in some capital. That's the starting point. In lieu of the capital that has been brought, we issue shares. We issue shares to the job founding members. So it is the core of the company. So that comes, your equity financing comes under your capex or capital expenditure. Equity financing means you raising money by issuing ownership of the company. If I'm selling 10% of my stake and getting some money in value, in that value, that comes under capital expenditure. Whereas you have revenue expenditure. Revenue expenditure is something similar to working capital. Generally, a very basic level, we classify capital into two types, right? Fixed capital and working capital. Fixed capital and working capital, right? So, what is fixed capital? All that investment that you make on the physical assets of the company, that is your fixed capital. And working capital is day-to-day -day expenditures. If you want, how are you going to pay for these bills? That is working capital. The same concept, you can bring it here. Capital expenditure becomes your fixed capital. Revenue expenditure becomes your working capital. So what is debt financing? Debt financing is raising debt, issuing a bond. If you require, let's say, 1,000 rupees, how are you going to get the 1,000 rupees? That is debt financing. So using different type of instruments, using different type of debt instruments to borrow the 1,000 rupees that are required. Why are you needing 1,000 rupees as part of your working capital? So this comes under revenue expenditure. So debt financing is the ways and means that a company employs to raise debt. Issuing a bond is debt financing. So debt financing you do, you take loan for a day-to-day -day expenditures to run the company. So debt financing comes under, so what is the statement saying? Debt financing comes under revenue expenditure, whereas equity financing comes under capital expenditure. So your second statement is wrong. And answer is only one and two because they have asked correct statement. So the answer is only one, A, one only. Then, indirect transfers. Uh, this topic has been in the news for the past 10, 15 years. It has been in news so much that media has ignored this completely. What is indirect transfers? It has started from Vodafone case, Vodafone Hutchison. So it started from Vodafone. Then you have Keynes case. So there are many such cases. Every one or two years, there will be such type of uh, transactions. In fact, the larger topic which it is part of is retrospective taxation. So whenever retrospective taxation happens, it is retrospective taxation happens to counter the indirect transfers. What does it mean indirect transfers? Simply a foreign company, it owns assets in India. Let's say Vodafone, right? Vodafone owns assets, used to own assets in India. And they will open so many holding companies in foreign jurisdictions and they say that one of such holding company, they will, so they will say that what? They will say that, so these are the assets in India, physical assets in India. They will be owned by a holding company, let's say somewhere in a tax haven like Bermuda Islands. Then there will be another company, so Vodafone. And Hutch, it was Hutchison SR in, earlier. So Hutch owned these assets through a holding company in a tax haven like Bermuda Islands. Hutch sold these assets indirectly. How? They sold this holding company which was in Bermuda Islands to Vodafone. 
So Vodafone also has another holding company. So they transferred the ownership of the holding company, not the physical assets. So now the new owner is Vodafone. Why do companies do this? To save taxes. So when a physical assets change hands, there will be a capital appreciation, capital gains tax, many such taxes to avoid that. What they are doing now, they did not directly transfer the assets, but they have gone for indirect transfer. That's what it is. So indirect transfer means if you go through the options, last option is the best. A foreign company transfers shares and such shares derive their substantial value from assets located in India. Such shares derive a substantial value from assets located in India. That's how it is done. That is known as indirect Uh, hi Krishna, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so that is indirect tax. So other options just go through them, they don't make any sense. A Indian company investing in a foreign enterprise and paying taxes to a foreign country on the profits, has got, no, no, no. It is done to avoid taxes. So that's where indirect transfers are. So it has been in use in the past 10, 15 years. I think recently Kane, Kane India, uh, they have uh, come to uh, an agreement, they can come to a compromise with the government of India. So what will the government do? To avoid indirect trans such type of indirect transfer of assets in foreign jurisdictions of assets located in India, they will go for retrospective taxation. Retrospective means taxing a transaction which has happened already. Anyway, straightforward question, very easy question, this is a very easy question. Then which of the following activities constitute real sector in the economy? You read this. I was one, you know, whenever when I looked at the question paper, how, how did how come they didn't ask any question from national income? They did ask, but indirectly. This is in fact you learn this in national income accounting actually. What does that economy generally, economic activities, they are classified real economy into monetary or financial economy. Monetary economy or financial economy. Real economy or monetary and financial economy. This is also, real economy is also known as non-monetary economy. Non-monetary economy. This is a very basic class. Your NCRT also has this. Your 11th NCRT, it has this classification. It's a very simple question. So, look at that. Farmers harvesting. So, what is a real economy? All those transactions which where there is a sale or production of goods and services. Farmers harvesting their crops. It is a real economic activity, it is a tangible asset in fact. Then textile means converting raw cotton into fabric, again a tangible asset is being produced. So all of them, both of them come under real economy. Whereas your monetary economy or financial economy, a commercial bank lending money to a trading company, it is part of monetary economy. It is part of financial economy, not real economy. So this is wrong. Likewise, a corporate body issuing repeat denominated bonds overseas, they just gave that to confuse you. It doesn't matter. It is raising a form of a debt. There is no good or service there. And even if there is some, in this case there is service, but it is part of non, it is part of monetary economy or financial economy, not part of real economy. See, simply you can understand like, you know, it's not exactly correct, but just Real economy means your traditional economy. Before the services sector have emerged as the way they have, real economy is a traditional economy. Traditional manufacturing processes, all of them comes under your real economy. Okay, so exclude three and four, the answer will be one and two. Yes, perfect, Prem and uh, Krishna, yeah. Then with reference to foreign owned e-commerce firms operating, yes. Uh, it was in news, it was constantly in news. The government wants to regulate the e-commerce companies a lot. So look at the statements. They can sell their own goods in addition to offering their platforms as marketplaces. Amazon and Flipkart, they are, just a second guys. Uh, okay sir, okay sir. <laughs> so Amazon and Flipkart, you have Amazon and you have Flipkart, right? They are giving their Platforms, they are platform companies. So Amazon and Flipkart, they are giving their platforms, right? So they can't, just a second guys.
So Amazon and Flipkart, they are platform-based companies. The Ministry of Commerce, it, uh, it has been in the news past one, one and a half years. So what is the story? Government of India doesn't want Amazon and Flipkart to sell their own goods. They have to just offer their platforms to the sellers in India. That's it, number one. Number two, they are also not supposed to own, if you go on to Amazon and Flipkart, there are these companies like Aperio Retail. There is one company on Flipkart that is Aperio Retail. Uh, I think on Amazon, not on Flipkart. Then you also have another, I don't recollect, I can't recollect. But the point is, the second statement, the degree to which they can own big sellers on their platforms is limited. So this Aperio Retail, they are very big sellers. So they, it's like, you know, this particular Aperio Retail does around 50% of, 50 of the sale. So the idea is that they can sell their own goods in addition to offering their platform sales. But this is wrong. They can't sell. The government said that they can't sell. So one is wrong. So this is wrong. Then degree to which they can own big sellers on their platforms is limited. Yes, the government has said that. It has said there is a limit of 25% or 24%. So this is correct. The answer is B2 only. Answer is B2 only. So then inflation index one is a very good question. I have just covered it. Inflation, what are IIBs? IIBs, inflation indexing. The concept of inflation indexing is you index the principal, the face value of the bond to inflation. You change that. So you don't change the coupon rate actually. Coupon rate is fixed. What changes is your face value of the bond according to inflation rate. So if inflation is high, then the face value increases, then the face value decreases. So what changes is the face value of the bond. So now come back. Government can reduce the coupon rates on its borrowing by way of IIBs. No, this option is wrong. So done, done, done. The op option will be two and three. But let's look at them. Inflation provide, IIBs provide protection to the investors from uncertainty regarding inflation. Yes, of course, that's the very purpose. And the interest received as well as uh, wait, the interest received as well as capital gains on IIBs are not taxable. Yes, there is an income tax exemption when it comes to the interest. That is, the option will be 2 and 3. Then, G20 framework, G20 common framework. This was in news, G20 agreement. This was in news. It is a straightforward uh, current affairs question. It is an initiative endorsed by G20 together with Paris Club. Yes, if uh, the answer is correct. It is an initiative to support low income countries. Yes, countries, particularly low income countries, as part because of the COVID shock, they can't you know, service their debt, the bonds that they have issued, the borrowings that they have made. So to help them, the G20 group has come, IMF and G20 group together have come up with this G20 common framework. That's the idea. So both of them are correct. Then, with reference to Indian economy, yeah, inflation, inflation, inflation. There's a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions on inflation. Uh, if inflation is too high, Reserve Bank of India is likely to buy government securities. If inflation is high, it means that money supply in the economy is high, which means that money has to be sucked in. Money has to be sucked out of economy. So what should RBI do? RBI should sell the bonds, not buy the bonds. RBI should sell the bonds. In that way, people will give the money that they have. So this is wrong. So exclude 1, 2, and 3. 2 and 3 will be answered, but look at them. If the rupee is rapidly depreciating, RBI is likely to sell dollars in the market. Yes, when will it depreciate? When there is oversupply of rupees. So suck away. Suck some... Uh, some rupees from the market. How can RBI do that? By selling dollars. So give dollars to the market, take rupees from the market. That's what RBI will do. This is part of RBI sterilization steps, sterilization measures. And third one, if interest rates in the USA or European Union are for to fall, that is likely to induce RBI to buy dollars. Yes, when the interest rate falls, there will be flow of money, capital from those countries into India to take advantage of the low interest rates. So more the dollars, there will be excess dollars in the economy, then RBI will have to buy that excess dollars to stabilize the economy. And the last question, yes, rear near. This is a very, this of all the questions, this is the a bit really diffi difficult question. 
of all the questions. Not really difficult, but kind of difficult, moderately difficult, we can say. So first and foremost, an increase in nominal effective, nominal effective exchange rate indicates the appreciation of rupee. Yes, near and rear, if you read the concepts, these are used in the foreign exchange markets. So near, just assume one dollar is equal to 70 rupees, right? So one rupee is equal to how much? One by 70, right? So if you are when will this, this is near, near is the nominal value. So when will this value increase when your denominator decrease, means 70 should become 50, right? As this denominator decreases, your near will increase. What is saying? An increase in nominal effective exchange rate indicates the appreciation of rupee, meaning if one dollar is equal to 70 rupees, this 70 is becoming 50, nothing but appreciation of rupee. I'm just giving the simplest way. This is the this is this is the simplest way to understand these concepts of near and rear. So hence one is correct. Then rear. Rear is generally it is calculated the ratio of near exchange rate and purchasing power parity exchange rate. So these are calculations and all of them are a bit difficult. But the idea is rear, if rear increases, it means that your trade competitiveness will decrease, it will not increase. Your trade competitiveness decreases whenever your rear improves. So the second option is wrong. So take out the second option. There is only one option with left that's left with one and three. So look at the increasing trend in domestic inflation related to inflation in other countries likely to cause an increasing divergence between near and rear. By exclusion criteria, we can go with 1 and 3, but 3 is also, there will be a lot of debates. There will be one or two questions where there will raise lot of debates every year. This is one such statement. Because the divergence will also be relative in nature. So divergence will not increase excessively. So, but if you know, if you know that 2 is wrong, then there, your answer will be 1 and 3 only. Right? And finally, the last question, a simple question. Rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility are related to the provisions of lending by which one of the following? Again, the straightforward question, International Monetary Fund. As part of COVID reconstruction, these, what are these, these are different types of windows that are available for countries to borrow as much as possible when they are facing this balance of payment crisis. So these are like emergency steps. And flexible steps. So that's about your uh, economy discussion. So there have been around 21 questions, 21 to 22 questions. Of all of them, it is easy. Actually, economy this year is very, not very easy, but it is, we can say it is easier, provided you have been reading newspaper. Uh, the questions are beautifully framed, except for one or two questions, but most of the questions are very good. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's all that we have to offer in terms of economy. The next module will start very shortly. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, guys. So good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is me, Sayyad Suryatullah. Welcome to Vishnu Academy. As you know that we are doing a very, very long series of knowing you, giving you the best and the first okay, current affairs, uh, this uh, UPSC question paper discussion. So I hope that this is all uh, like you are going to take inside you and those who have already written the examination, this particular thing will be damn helpful to all of you. Okay, so let us uh, go ahead in our discussion. So basically what I have done is I have given you some uh, information with regard to uh, what kind of questions have come. As you all know that there are factual questions are there and there are conceptual questions will be there and static questions will be there. Okay, current affairs question, right. The, on these three parameters only, UPSC will make the news. When I have analyzed the paper, so I have got the questions and the categories in this way. So current affair related, three questions have come. Okay, these three questions are facts only. Okay, then on facts basis, you have got around six questions because six, again I have added these three here. That's why here six only, but they are also facts only. The current affairs are also fact and with regard to the concept there are only two questions we have got. I mean concepts in the sense that when you are in the classroom and you have learnt it 
and you have written a very big answer on it. I mean, like you understood what it is, uh, what are the challenges to it, what are the advantages to it, what is the principle behind it. So you have learned it very, very uh, properly with that particular topic. Then I have included all of that into concept. Okay. So current affair based, factual based and concept based. So if you see in this year geography UPSC paper, you have got almost like six questions. Okay. Complete factual basis. And uh, three questions you have got from current affairs, again they are also facts and hardly conceptual questions are only two. Okay? Let us discuss one by one the question. So I don't have to tell you what it is all about because those who are very, very well with regard to the environment and the biggest important topic in environment is what? Global warming and climate change. And 2021 also attains significance why? Because Glasgow summit happened and in Glasgow summit you all know that Panchamitra uh, promises uh, India has undertaken, right or wrong? So you might be aware of this fact that this global warming, the total fiasco around it is basically related to what? Greenhouse gases. Basically related to greenhouse gases. And many of the aspirants and students, okay, they may not think that agriculture may contribute anything to the greenhouse gas emissions. They may think like that. Okay, those who have studied, they may know that agriculture does contribute to the uh, global warming and it is one of the, they emit greenhouse gases also. You are aware of this fact. But basically, as a normal, as a beginner in the UPSC examination or if you are in the first year of your preparation, you might be knowing that global warming is because of what combustion of fossil fuels. So your mindset will be restricted to that only. But it is not so. There are many sources where the greenhouse gases uh, emissions are there. Okay, one such is what? Agriculture. One such is what? Agriculture. So if you see this one, what does it talk about? It talks about which uh, among the following crops, which one of the following gas, which one of the following rice, which one of the following crop emits, emits methane and nitrous oxide. These two are greenhouse gas and they are asking that which one of the following crop emits these two and as you know that agriculture is not a natural practice, it is not a divine practice, right or wrong. It does not happen just like cloud will form automatically. Okay, it is given by the nature, minerals are formed, given by the nature, but agriculture is not generally happens anywhere, until unless you don't do it, until unless man does not do it, right. That's why this total agriculture activity is an anthropogenic activity, means human being does it and because of our agricultural activity only, the greenhouse gases emissions are there, okay. So we want to know this crop that is responsible for this emission of methane and nitrous oxide. So our answer here is rice. Our answer here is what? Rice. So you can see here, fine. So this particular question is very factual question. In any notes, in any compendiums, okay, in any classroom, this is, this should be known to you because it is properly been thought, okay, even by a even for a lower category examinations also, this is a normal question. Okay, this is clear. Hello Krishna, hello Rahul. Right. Fine. Let us go for the next one. System of rice intensification. System of rice intensification. This is also a very big learning topic in your UPSC preparation. Already on this, a question has come two years back. The same question has been repeated again. Same to same question has been repeated again. Okay, same to same I am saying. So system of rice intensification, you can understand that this SRI system, SRI system, it is not a proper methodology. Means like this you have to do. It's not like that. System of rice intensification is a process. Is a process, is a dynamic and living process where you are going to change the crops according to the season. You are going to till your crops according to the uh, season. You are using the uh, water according to the requirement and availability of what resource, whatever you are having, water resource and the requirement of the crops also. So you are just trying to, what you are just trying to have ideal solutions. You are just trying to make what ideal solutions for that particular crop. That is called as system of rice intensification. We are not calling it as agriculture intensification. Agriculture intensification is nothing but when you take when you grow more and more crops in a land area then you call it as agriculture intensification we are talking about rice intensification it means what you are trying to grow more and more rice okay you are trying to grow more and more rice in a given area nothing but here we are talking about rice productivity 
means a given area you want to increase more so if you follow this system it's a system it is a methodology okay generally it is being there in Tadakistan and then later on many countries followed it and it has also been in our country and in our country Tamil Nadu was the first state to start this okay so it's a basic principle is it's a way it's a way to manipulate crops it's a way to manipulate conditions so that you get what higher yields so all of these are the benefits you derive from this particular method okay so your answer is what D then which one of the following lakes of West Africa has become dry and turned into a desert if you are aware of this if you are doing your previous year questions okay of UPSC that is what we already always tell you that go and just have a look or you can I, we will also say that practice the previous year question paper why because this kind of question same to same question was there two years back with regard to RLC with regard to RLC there there also they asked that which one of the following river has gone has dried up and lost we lost a lake so RLC we lost in the same way again we lost another see that is called as Lake Fegubin Lake Fegubin so you can see here India's web portal water portal India's water portal so this has been directly picked up by the UPSC from the India's water portal website so you can see here this particular lake Fegubin is in Mali is in Mali West African or you can say that Central African country okay Mali and here you are having Timbuktu Timbuktu near around you will have this lake it was like this in 1978 it was very very big see the water is there inside it okay slowly slowly you you see here it has been completely dried up it has been completely dried up the reason is not because of we are doing it like we are almost like we are uh, maximum we are the culprits of global warming and all the disasters right many of the disasters we are the culprits because we do such kind of activities for our needs and requirements but here the case is not like that okay this particular lake has been dried up because what successive droughts successive droughts has happened in Mali and they have not linked the rivers just like we started interlinking our rivers no so that our deficit uh, water rivers have to get water from the surplus rivers so we we got proactive and we started this particular project so that our rivers should always be what flowing right but they have not that technology you know that African country countries are not that technologically advanced so they have not taken proper measures uh, to put water into it so what has happened so successive drought happened over a period of time in their particular area and they lost the complete lake Fegubin okay in the Mali fine it, okay fine hello Vishwesh all is good okay so the answer for here is Lake Fagubin. Now we have got Gandikota Canyon. Okay, now everyone, those who are preparing for the next year also, you don't have to concentrate only on what rivers of our country, okay, dams of our country, national parks across the across that particular rivers and uh, uh, cities across the river. Now you should also concentrate on waterfalls and you should concentrate also on what Grand Canyons. This is considered as India's Grand Canyon. Okay. So this Gandikota Canyon is located on Pennar River, Pennar River in Andhra Pradesh. Okay, it is in Andhra Pradesh. Please remember this point. Gandikota Canyon. Okay, this Pennar River starts in what? Karnataka district is Chikmagalur and goes into goes into Andhra Pradesh and drains into what? Bay of Bengal. So very factual question. That's why we always say to the students that one-liners are important. Eight to nine one-liner questions will come in the examination. And this year has come 18 questions are there on one one-liners so very easy if you are just aware of the fact you would have done this very easy question okay then this one is also very easy because even for banking and very smaller examination also anybody will read so UPSC students definitely would have done this for sure it's a very factual question okay see you see knock rake knock rake I have given here knock rake is there in Meghalaya so it is uh, the question given here is Sikkim so this is going to be wrong okay Namcha Barwa anyone will know there is only one important peak here is there highest peak in Arunachal Pradesh is Namcha Barwa and they are talking about Gharwal Gharwal is in what Uttarakhand range Uttarakhand state is there no there you are having what Gharwal Himalayas okay so this is also going to be wrong and the only one which is right is Nanda Devi Kumayu so you can see here you are having Nanda Devi these are called as Kumayu Himalayas okay then what is your answer which one of the following are correctly matched so only two right 
This is only correctly match. Got it? Very, very, very easy. Okay. Everyone would have done this for sure. Very good, Vishwesh. Namcha Barwai in Arunacha Pradesh. That is also right. Hello, Krishna. All good? Okay. Fine. Next. The term Levant, little bit very difficult question. Why? Because this has not been mentioned in many of the standard books. That has been not been mentioned in standard books. This question is a little bit, you can say that out of out of the topics of any of us. Okay. Because it is very localized thing. It is localized things in and around the Mediterranean region. You know that this is this is this we are having what? We are having this uh, Europe, and you know that this we are having what? Africa is there, and this is what? Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so the answer here is it is a region along the East Mediterranean shores. East Mediterranean shores. A wind is there here which blows towards east, which blows towards east. Okay, so this region is they are talking about, and this term Levant is related to this. Okay, related to the wind, wind which is going towards what East Mediterranean regions going towards this starting here and going towards east mediterranean region so it's a wind system okay all of them are very very different okay again you can see here this is the fourth one fourth one is again belongs to mediterranean sea so they have given what entire entire is wrong here because it is not entire in the mediterranean only this part this part is only that particular levant wind is there not the entire so you might get confused here and here but the answer here is a okay fine Then this is a very, very factual question. It is there on the Indian government, our Indian government, Atomic, Ministry of Atomic Energy, Ministry of Atomic Energy. Fine. So you can see that it has been published in the Hindu newspaper. This was a current affair. It has been published in the Hindu newspaper. You can see here, properly they have given you, monazite is a primary source of thorium. They have given you here. So first of all, monazite is a ore, my dear students. It's a ore. The ore will have lot of minerals. Okay, so monazite also have many other minerals. In that one is thorium. Okay, and whatever the monazite ore is, you know, in that whatever the metals or non-metals, whatever you find, they are very rare in the earth. That's why they are called as rare earth elements. So this statement is one. Second statement is anyhow we have cross verified with the Hindu newspaper only. Okay. Third one, monazite occurs naturally in the entire Indian coastal sands. It is there. It is there here only. And the fourth one, in India, government bodies only can process or export monazite. It is written here. See, currently, Indian Rare Earths, a public sector unit under Department of Atomic Energy, has the permission for commercial exploration of monazite. Commercial exploration of monazite. Okay. India is having largest reserves in the world with regard to monocyte. So here, this is you already know. This is you might be knowing it and this you may not know. But 1, 2, 3 is there here. 1, 2, 3 is there here. So you, you should know. You should know that fourth one. You should know that fourth one. Otherwise, you cannot do it. The fourth one is also actually there in the newspaper itself. So fourth one is also right here. 1, 2, 3, 4 is your answer. Okay. So you are having in your syllabus. Okay, metals and non-metals, mineral resources are there in your syllabus. So if you are aware of these mineral resources and the distribution, okay, this is about distribution, right? If you know one, two, three, then this is a current affair. So it's a mix of what? Facts and current affair. Mix of what? Facts and current affair. Right, Vishwesh, that is true. Then the next one, next one we'll see. Okay, so it's a very, very easy question again. In the Northern Hemisphere, the same question has also been repeated in the previous year questions. Question paper, if you just see, you will find this. This on this diagram, nearly about in last five years, two to three times they have asked the question. Okay, what they are asking in the northern hemisphere, the longest day, longest day generally comes in June. Okay, June 20, summer, longest day, June 20. So, June 20, June 1 to 15 is first half, 15 to 30 is what? Second half. So, what is your answer? First one they have given July, July. This is completely wrong. Okay, then June, June, first half is wrong. Second half they have given, that is absolutely 
right because second half of the june month you will see what summer solicits in our country okay the topic of cancer will be there at the top of our okay on india that's why you will have a little bit longer day okay and it is recorded longest day is recorded on june 22 22nd very very easiest question any upsc aspirant should do it because it is related to what solar system latitude longitude the very first chapter question so this has to be done by everyone okay then let us go ahead ram sir convention this is a very very easiest one again you will study in environment you will study in geography very easy question you can see here okay horeca wetland horeca wetland if you see this is not in not in punjab it is in jammu and kashmir you can see here this is in jammu and kashmir then you are having renuka wetland renuka wetland they are talking they are saying that it is in himachal pradesh so this is wrong anyhow renuka in himachal pradesh this is true renuka is in himachal pradesh that is true this is one is right rudra sagar tripura it is not mentioned here but but it is there sorry it is there rudra sagar tripura this is also right then fourth one sastham kota sastham kota they are saying that it is in tamil nadu so you see that sastham kota is in what kerala sastham kota is in kerala that's why this is wrong so only one pair is right two pair is right so our answer is only two pairs are right only two pairs are right okay right then let us go this is also a very easy dam question it is a dam related question ghatprabha has never any relation with telangana remember this point ghatprabha is a river okay which originates in karnataka gandhi sagar rudra sagar indra sagar okay basically in madhya pradesh so not rudra gandhi and indra in madhya pradesh so this is right then indra sagar andhra pradesh wrong because i told you that gandhi and indra are in madhya pradesh so this is wrong maithan okay it's not in chatisgarh it is in jharkhand so here the answer is only one pair is right only one pair is right if you see here see here you are having gandhi sagar you might be seeing it gandhi sagar is there okay here in karnataka you are seeing what ghataprabha karnataka you are saying ghataprabha now if you see here this is maithan this is maithan that is in jharkhand that is in jharkhand so with this three you can easily do your okay uh, this uh, question so very very easy question at this point of time very very easy so you are if you say that sir geography what is the uh, how is the paper i will say that it is less than moderate it is not difficult at all less than moderate if you are just knowing things also it is enough okay last year what tougher okay this is a conceptual question that's why i told you system of rice intensification concept and this is also a concept high clots primary reflex okay solar radiation and cools high clots means if this is the land surface if this is the land surface these clots are called as high clots these clouds are called as what low clouds and this is our sun and it is what giving what insulation so we know we should know the property as you all know that we are having 37 or 40 degrees centigrade is there okay but sun light and also a form of energy if it is not reflected back then we will have 60 to 70 degrees centigrade we cannot even survive we all will die so you might understood that you had already learned in your geography there is a concept of heat budget heat budget it means what the 100% whatever the light and heat energy coming from the sun not 100% reaches to earth otherwise we cannot even survive 50% of that will be emitted back so there is a reflection is there absorption is not there 100% absorption is not there there is a reflection is also there okay this balancing act is done by what our high clouds and low clouds generally what happens the low high clouds they will allow the radiations to come they will allow the radiations to come through them okay and uh, high clouds will allow the low clouds will reflect back low clouds will reflect back high clouds will allow low clouds will reflect back so whatever the 100% is coming 50% uh, 100% will come through what high clouds and 50% will be emitted by low clouds and on the earth surface you and me will experience a normal temperature you and me will experience a normal temperature but in our question they have given reverse okay they said that high clouds primarily reflect solar radiation as i have told you they don't re reflect they generally allow they generally transmit low clouds have high absorption no they don't absorb high they generally reflect they generally reflect with this two only you can directly say that d is the answer d is the answer neither one 
not true both are incorrect both are incorrect okay neither one nor two are correct understood right right this is all about your geography okay so thanks a lot for into me and stay tuned so that you will be having what uh, history discussion now and uh, make sure that how good you are doing and uh, have a nice day bye bye so hello guys so welcome all so as you know today the morning by 11:30 uh, general studies paper 1 got completed and we are here to explain so what is like you know the approximate uh, right answers you call it obviously uh, upsc is the final word so wh whatever like you know we express our views and whatever say the answers we are going to like you know exp explain so these are the like you know are best of knowledge so when it comes to history totally 15 questions have been asked totally 15 questions when it comes to the ancient so we we were discussing csc prelims 2022 from history totally 15 questions that is from ancient five questions followed by medieval seven questions and the rest of that is like you know modern like totally 15 questions and no doubt this year the number of questions have decreased especially from modern please write when it comes to 2021 prelims we did come across for about 25 questions from history when it comes to this year csc prelims 2022 that is only 15 questions i repeat from ancient we have five questions from medieval seven questions and modern three questions and when we understand the nature of the questions when we understand like you no know, the toughest nature of the questions in classes we generally say aspirants shall concentrate on technical terms right reason being upsc generally concentrates on technical terms right let us let us start with we were discussing set a please right? set a question paper right? so the 52nd question from medieval indian history in medieval india the term phanam referred in medieval india the term phanam referred and let me tell you few questions in general studies prelims whatever prelims you talk about whether upsc tspsc apppsc and even like you know the other exams the few questions we can answer by using our common sense the best example the technical term called phanam right we taught in classes phanam please as part of ancient indian history like you know karsha pana related to coin right phanam of ancient india became phanam in medieval india you need not write entire what we call options please write. say option a clothing option b coins option c ornaments option d weapons phanam phanam coins that's it that's the right answer right so questions can also be answered through elimination method fine So another question from modern Indian history. Consider the following freedom fighters, and need not to tell you in classes we discussed. Besides, besides Indian National Congress, Indian National Congress (INC). Besides Indian National Congress, we have many organizations. We have many youngsters who believed in who believed in violence, please. when it comes to international congress believed in non violence ahimsa international congress believed in satyagraha 
Indian National Congress believe like you know, the programs I am talking about that is Baikot, Swarajya, Swadeshi and other programs. When it comes to like you know other than Indian National Congress, youngsters, organizations believed in violence. Now the question is related to them. Right? The first one, Barindra Kumar Ghosh, second one, Jogesh Chandra Chatterjee, third one, Raz Bihari Bose. The question goes, who of the above was oblique were actively associated with Gadar party? So, when you say Gadar party related to violence, they wanted to get freedom by expelling British. How? Through armed struggle. We have n number of like you know revolutionary organizations, Anushilan Samiti, Hindustan Republican Army, Hindustan, Repub Hindustan Socialist Republican Army, Bharat Mata Society, Abhinav Bharat, what not? Please. We have n number of organizations including political parties which believed in violence like you know through, through uh, what do we call uh, armed struggle they wanted to get, they wanted to liberate their, um, their mother country from British. So, when, when we confine the answer Barindra Kumar Ghosh, as I was telling like you know you can go through uh, elimination process. Please. As far as Barindra Kumar Ghosh is concerned, the gentleman, the brother of Arabindo Ghosh, please. we did discuss as part of classes. Please. Barindra Kumar Ghosh, the brother of Arabindo Ghosh, Bhupendra Nath Datta, the brother of Narendra Nath Datta, popularly known as Swami Vivekananda, right? including like you know, the gentleman, Jogendra, like Jogesh Chandra Chatterjee, earlier he was also associated Anu Shilan Samiti, one of the revolutionary organizations belonged to Bengal. Right? A little later, Jogesh Chandra Chatterjee also belonged to Hindustan Republican Association, little later it was renamed as Hindustan Republican. Hindustan Socialist Republican Army and the remaining Ras Bihari Bose. Ras Bihari Bose is the right answer. Like you know it was a gentleman no doubt he was also associated with violent activities like you know the violence other activities and when British made efforts to capture this gentleman he simply ran away from India right? and he got settled in Japan and from Japan he like you know he made efforts to create awareness what kind of awareness, revolutionary, uh, uh, what do we call revolutionary say uh, activities and it was a gentleman who was associated with Gadar party. So, for, for this question the right answer is Ras Bihari Bose. Right? And one more thing you shall keep in mind Ras Bihari Ghosh, it is one of the leaders of Indian National Congress, right? keep in mind. Right? Ras Bihari Bose, revolutionary leader who believed in violence. When it comes to Ras, Ras Bihari Ghosh, as part of national movement we discussed, it was a gentleman who was the president of 1907 Surat session. Surat session, like you know, Surat session, it was popularly called as Surat split, we call it. It was in this session. Surat session, Indian National Congress literally divided into two halves that is moderates and extremists. Right? right, one more please. With the reference to the proposals of Crips mission, consider the following statements. So, as far as, as far as like you know Crips mission is concerned. So, in order to get the support from India or British India you call it, British government sent many proposals were associated with Sir Stafford Cripps right, during Second World War. Second World War, the span of Second World War 1939-1945 fought between Axis and Allied. One of the countries of allied that is England 
since england was badly in need of resources whose resources the resources of colonies one among them was india so we generally call british india right so in order to get the support of british india the resources of british india the men material of british india so british government sent so many proposals or so many like you know provisions uh, these pro these proposals brought by sir stafford cripps the position leader in english government and one of the good friends of jawaharlal nehru so the two statements the first statement says the constituent assembly would have members nominated by the provincial assemblies as well as the princely states right the answer like you know the first statement is correct so one of the provisions of sir stafford cripps or cripps proposal that is india would be given dominion status second one is formation of constituent assembly and the constituent assembly constituted the members of both when i say both that is from british india that is from british india and from princely states thereby first statement is correct then how about second statement any province which is not prepared to accept the new constitution would have the right to sign a separate agreement with britain regarding its future and let me tell you this is another proposal of sir stafford cripps the right answer is option c both 1 and 2 are correct guys come back so for 50 for 54th question that is uh, set a the right answer is both 1 and 2 are correct 55th question right with reference to indian history consider the following texts it's like one of the question from ancient indian history need not to tell you the question from ancient indian history like you know the scholars especially jain scholars and buddhist scholars and their books obviously right the question related to strictly speaking the question related to jainism and buddhism right so in classes we generally say upsc targets upsc concentrates how best it can eliminate the aspirants right so how how upsc like you know say eliminates aspirants very simple go to the remote areas and concentrate on technical terms right so been emphasizing you must concentrate on technical terms right fine keeping us at the stuff so first one neti prakarana or pakarana it's in prakrit text let me tell you second one is parishishta parvan third one is avadhana shataka and fourth one is trishas trishas tilaka trishas tilaka akshana or trish trishas tilaka akshana maha purana please the now the actual question goes like you know which of the following are jain texts i let me tell you once again we did discuss as part of classes in fact we did not discuss neti prakarana followed by followed by avadhana shataka but we did made a reference of parishishta parvan followed by trishastilaka like you know uh, purana please when it comes to neti purana are prakarana some of the buddhist texts let me tell you right so buddhist texts as part of like you know classes we referred buddhist texts were written in pali language we have three sacred texts in buddhism that is sutta pitaka vinaya pitaka abhidhamma pitaka besides pitakas we have many more buddhist texts and these texts were written not only in pali language when it comes to mahayana buddhism even sanskrit language so what exactly what we call neti prakarana or neti pakarana it was one of the components of khuddaka nikaya one of the components of khuddaka nikaya and khuddaka nikaya is nothing but it's a buddhist text based khuddaka nikaya it's a, it's a buddhist text it's a pali language right when it comes to jain texts maximum were written in prakrit language right? 
and no doubt Pali and Prakrit we generally considered the languages of masses when it comes to Sanskrit the language of microscopic minorities that is like you know Brahmins. Then how about Parishishta Parvan? It is one of the Sanskrit texts, Jain texts, one of the Sanskrit Jain texts written by written by one of the Jain scholars lived in 12th century AD, one of the Jain scholars lived in 12th century AD by name Sharat. It was the gentleman who explains how Jainism experienced schism. How Jainism experienced schism, right? Parishista Parvan, the 12th century Sanskrit book. Sharat, in some texts, you also come across Hema Chandra. Right? So, we did refer as part of Mauryan age, one of the prominent rulers of Mauryan empire by name Chandragupta Maurya. In fact, we consider him as a founder of Chandragupta, I am sorry, founder of Mauryan dynasty. Otherwise, we, we traditionally use the term called Mauryan empire. It was in 3rd century, 3rd century BC when Pataliputra experienced famines. The book says, Chandragupta Maurya being a Jain along with Jain monks, the gentlemen got migrated to South India. Right? Having got migrated to South India, the gentleman got settled at a place called Stavana Belogola and where he, he got performed Sallekhana that is the form through which a person can get salvation according to Jainism. Parishista Parvan, that is one of the like you know authentic sources of Jainism. It talks about how schism occurred in Jainism, that is in Jainism you have two sects that is that is Shvetambaras and the Gambaras. Those Jains who remained in North India, they were called as Shvetambars and those Jains who got migrated to Deccan, South India, they got settled in South India like you know, and Belugala which comes in Karnataka, Hassan district of Karnataka state, they were called as the Gambars. So, Parishista Parvan, Jain text which was written by Hema Chandra, right? Sanskrit language. Then how about Avadhana Shataka? Avadhana Shataka, it is one of the Buddhist texts, let me tell you. Right? When we understand the content of Avadhana Shataka, it explains the previous births of Buddha, otherwise called as Bodhi Sattvas. And we did refer as part of like you know classes, Bodhi Sattva concept was taken by Hinduism. It is nothing but the Shavatar concept we have referred. Then how about, how about Trishastilaka Mahapurusha or Mahapurana, once again it is an Jain text. 63 great saints are associated with Jainism. Right? So, the right answer is 2 and 4. So, my point is like you know you, you can answer by using the strategy called elimination. So, question from someone Jain sex means what? Like you know, sect as far as like you know, sect is concerned. Every religion has got sex resmitted, schism. If a if a split occurs in a religion, we call it schism. Right? And let me tell you, no religion is free from schism. Whatever religion you talk about which is unearthed. Buddhism, we have, we have like you know say Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism. Jainism that is Shvetambaras, Digambaras, come to Islam, Sunnis, Shias, come to Christianity, Roman Catholics, Protestants, come to Hinduism, Shaivism and Vaishnavism and within Shaivism we have subsects, within Vaishnavism we have subsects. So, it is all about like you know differences, you call it ideological differences and other differences. So, every religion has got, every religion has got sects based. Right, thank you. Right. So, for 55th question, the right answer is option B. Next one, 
with reference to indian history consider the following pairs it's an uh, one of the like you know general questions we which we do get even it was a previous question let me previous previous question of upsc general studies prelims so match the following you call it but in these say uh, csc prelims 2022 we found a different terminology in upsc that is how many pairs how many pairs how many pairs given above are correctly so in the previous exams the previous questions when you go through say option a 1 2 only option b 1 3 only option c 2 only option d like you know this is how the pattern we found but when it comes to csc prelims 2022 uh, say none of the pairs only one pair only two pairs and all the three pairs right so let us let us confine to the uh, what do we call topic with reference to indian history consider the following pairs arya deva like on one hand the personalities scholars you call them on the other hand their professions right so arya deva jain scholar dijnaga buddhist scholar natha muni vaishnava scholar right when it comes to arya deva strictly speaking arya deva it's one of the disciples of acharya nagarjuna an acharya nagarjuna buddhist scholar especially acharya nagarjuna belonged to mahayana buddhism as part of indian history discussed acharya nagarjuna and no doubt there are there are like you know different opinions as far as acharya nagarjuna is concerned few scholars opine that he lived in the court of kanishka one of the great rulers of kushans and another scholars another group of scholars opine that he belonged to shatavahana period keep aside right? but historical personality acharya nagarjuna acharya nagarjuna had many disciples one among them was arya deva and arya deva also happened to be buddhist scholar not jain scholar right? the second one dijnaga the right answer yes he was a buddhist scholar besides buddhist scholar besides what we call say sanskrit scholar dijnaga he he was associated with logical sciences let me tell you so now the patent question tarka we call it in sanskrit telugu lo tarka shastramu antam tarkamu logic apply rationality apply scientific temper since he was associated with when i say he dijnaga was associated with logical sciences and there is nothing is wrong in calling him he was popularly called as the father of logical sciences tarka shastra pitamahudu ani inan bilisar so buddhist scholar great buddhist scholar then have about natha muni it's one of the prominent sanskrit scholars who are associated with vaishnava sect of hinduism i need not to tell you the right answer 2 and 3 when i say 2 and 3 that is different pattern that is only two pairs are correct only two pairs are correct another question with reference to indian history consider the following statements and need not to tell you the, the the question is related to medieval indian history medieval indian history right once again in the classes we did discuss as part of delhi sultanate right as part of delhi sultanate i would say in fact this is not exaggeration at least from class notes when you attend the class when you understand the lecture when you like you know write down the important points when you when you made efforts to revise the stuff out of 15 questions i would say at least 12 questions you can answer please i was using the term called not to exaggerate to say please fine so with reference to indian history consider the following statement the question the question related to delhi sultanate the span of delhi sultanate 1526 i'm sorry the span of delhi sultanate the span of delhi sultanate 1206 1206 1526 and it was ruled by various dynasties right that is slave dynasty followed by khilji dynasty followed by tughlaq dynasty followed by said dynasty 
and Lodi dynastic. Reason being, in order to answer this question, like you know, you shall revise the entire stuff. The significance of slave dynasty, we have like you know, many rulers, totally nine rulers. The founder of slave dynasty, in fact, Kutubuddin Aibak, to whom we consider, and he happened to be the founder of Islamic empire in Hindustan. Kutubuddin Aibak succeeded by prominent ruler, I am talking about Altamash, otherwise called him Iltutmish. When Iltutmish was the ruler of Delhi Sultanate, from Central Asia, one of the nomadic tribes called Mongols made efforts to invade Hindustan. The nomads, barbaric, uncivilized. Some XYZ, like you know, stories are associated with Mongol invasions. So, why did they invade northwestern India, especially when Il Tutmish was the ruler of Delhi Sultanate? So, the first statement says the first Mongol invasion of India happened during the reign of Jalaluddin Khilji. Let me tell you the statement is incorrect because the first Mongol invasion of India happened when Il Tutmish or Altamash was the ruler of Hindustan, a ruler of Delhi Sultanate. The gentleman belonged to a dynasty called Slave Dynasty. My point is, in order to answer, in order to understand one statement, the so called stories have to be revised. That is the aroma of UPSC, let me tell you. That. So, first statement is incorrect. Then how about second statement, during the reign of Alauddin Khilji, one Mongol assault marched up to Delhi and besieged the city. The right answer, second statement is correct. Reason being, you can ask the question, as you taught in classes, the, the, like, you know, the, first, Muslim, the first Muslim ruler, that is Alauddin Khilji, modern Ranveer Singh. The significance of the gentleman, first Muslim ruler to get command over Hindustan. You call North India, you call Western India, you call North Western India, you call like you know Deccan, South India. The first Muslim ruler to get command over Hindustan. Then how did he defeat, you call it, or how did he how did he stand in front of Mongols? That's a like you know greatness of Mongols because they were ferocious fighters. They follow the slaughter, like you know, they follow the principle called general slaughtering. In fact, they follow the policy of Equality, please. Plundering the wealth by creating havoc, plundering the wealth by destroying the cities. Right? So, when Mongols invaded Hindustan, when Alauddin Khilji was a ruler, what is the response of Alauddin Khilji? Instead of like you know, instead of protecting Sultanate, instead of protecting the capital of Sultanate, that is Delhi, the gentleman simply ran away from capital and he took shelter at a place called Sikri for about 35 kilometers from Delhi. The second statement is correct. Third statement, Muhammad bin Tughlaq temporarily lost portions of northwestern, northwest of his kingdom to Mongols. The third statement is incorrect. Reason being, when Muhammad bin Tughlaq was the ruler of Hindustan or Delhi Sultanate, no Mongol invasion, as simple as it is. No doubt, Mongols invaded Hindustan when Tughlaq dynasty was ruling Sultanate. Especially, we discussed as part of like you no know, classes, medieval Indian history classes. Especially, there was a ruler by name Nasiruddin Muhammad Tughlaq, one of the rulers of Tughlaq dynasty. When Nasiruddin Muhammad Tughlaq was a ruler, Timur invaded Timur invaded Hindustan in the year 1398. We referred as part of classes. So, out of given options, first and third options are incorrect and second option correct. One more question and uh, let me profess, we did not discuss this question, even like you know for the first time I am listening the question. Please don't. One has to accept. We didn't we didn't cover this question, like you know, this particular statement, this this particular like you know, concept in the class, right? So the question goes with reference to Indian history, who of the following were known as 
Kulha Daran Roy. The first option, Arab merchants. Second, Kalandars. Third one, Persian calligraphists. And fourth one, Sayyids. As I was telling, you can, you can answer these kind of questions. Obviously, you can answer these kind of questions by using a little bit common sense and by using your knowledge. So, let us apply the so called elimination process. The Arab merchants obviously know because they were merchants, they were associated with trade and commerce. Second option, Kalandars. Kalandars, one of the Sufi sects we discussed as part of classes, Bhakti movement and Sufi movement, Chisti Silsila, Shruvardi Silsila. Kalandar Silsila, like, you know, Silsila, movement, right? Sufi movements and all that. Right? Persian calligraphists, yes, you can, you can stand a little bit on Persian calligraphist. Then how about Sayyids? So here, the answer revolves around option C and option D. 50%, 50% chances you call them, right? And no doubt, you shall keep in mind, we have negative marking, that is another story, right? So, out of, out of two options, the right answer is Sayyids. Reason being, Kulha, it is an Arabic term, which means a cap, let me tell you. Try to understand, right? Dharan, Dharinche Vadu, like the one who wears. Kulha, Dharan. And you can ask the question, that, that means like, you know, even Arab merchants who happen to be Muslims, they also wear the caps and all. But when it comes to Kulha Dharan, this particular, like, you know, the, this particular cap, which is meant for only Sayyids, right? As I was telling, in Islam, we have two sects, that is Sunnis and Shias, right? The followers of Abu Bakr, the prophets, like you know, father in law, they were called as Sunnis. The followers of Muhammad Ali, the son in law of Prophet Muhammad, they were called as Shias. Then the question is, then who are Sayyids, right? Sayyids, so one of the subsects of Shias, let me tell you, right? Reason being, reason being, Sayyids were the descendants of, they were the descendants of Fatima, they were the descendants of Fatima, that is the daughter of Prophet Muhammad and they were, it is one of the religious, one of the religious obligations you call them, they are supposed to wear, that is Kulha, Kulha Daran. And as, as we referred, that is one of the one of the dynasties ruled over Delhi Sultanate were the masters of Hindustan between 1206 to 1526, that is Sayyid's place. Slaves, Khiljis, Tughlaq, Sayyids and Lodis, right. So, Sayyid rulers, Sayyids, they were basically the descendants of Fatima's family place, right. right. So, the right answer, the right answer for 58th question, option D, please, right. So, one more question from, from modern Indian history, please. There is a, there is a chapter called Advent of the Europeans. We did discuss various European companies have entered in order to have commercial relations with Indian subcontinent and established the so called commercial relations on western coast on eastern coast, right. So, the question goes, with reference to Indian history, consider the following statements. The first statement, the Dutch said that Dutch like, you know, you also call them, we generally use a term called Dutch East India Company, please, D-E-I-C. The Dutch established their factories or warehouses on the east coast on lands granted to them by Gajapati rulers. Second statement, Alfonso de Albuquerque K. 
captured Goa from the Bijapur Sultanate. And third statement, the English East India Company established a factory at Madras on a plot of a land leased from a representative of the Vijayanagar Empire. It's a very, it's a need not it's one of the, one of the previous questions from, from X question, from Y question, from Z question, these three statements were, were like, you know, were picked it up and thrown to the faces of aspirants of 2022. We have always insisted aspirants, you shall go through the previous question paper. I need not to tell you the one who went through the previous question paper, you could have easily answered this. Let us confirm the question. So, first statement says, the Dutch established their factories, warehouses on the east coast on lands granted to them by Gajapati rulers, absolutely wrong place. Because, once again, we, dis we discussed as part of classes, by 15th century, the so-called Gajapati's got disappeared from the political map of Indian subcontinent. Then, how about Dutch? Dutch entered India from 17th century. A little bit common sense, right? obviously, with, with knowledge. We right? have learnt as part of a chapter called Advent of the Europeans, all European companies have entered India from western coast, whereas Dutch East India Company entered India from eastern coast. Right, keep aside. When it comes to second statement, second statement is correct. Right? So, one of the prominent governors of Portuguese East India Company, that is Albuquerque, captured Goa from, from by, by defeating Bijapur rulers, and this the gentleman like you know made Goa as the headquarters. Then, how about third statement? Third statement also correct. Second and third statements correct. Thereby, the right answer is option B. As far as, far as like you know, English East India Company is concerned, English East India Company developed three headquarters. What do we call today? Three metropolitan cities. That is that is like you know, that is Bombay on western coast, Calcutta on eastern coast and Madras on eastern coast. Bombay, Calcutta and Madras. When I say Madras, it was, it was like you know, it was like you know, Francis Day, the founder of Madras town, Madras city we call it, by taking the some, some sort of land and lease, one of the, one of the agents of Vijayanagar Empire. So, it was the gentleman who developed this. So, right answer for 59th question. Option B, please. Another question, it is an a tricky question. In fact, like, like you know, the paper setter went beyond Kautilya's Arthashastra. So, we generally confined, uh, let me tell you, like you know, we did not discuss as part of general classes, we, we did discuss as part of like you know, Mauryan Empire, the political theory of Kautilya. We did spend a lot, lot of time on Kautilya's Arthashastra, like, which has got, which has got, like, you know, the, so many facts, let me tell you. Arthashastra, uh, it is in the book, which was written by the gentleman, which talks about the politico administration of Mauryans, otherwise called as Magadans. So, let us confine to the topic. According to Kautilya's Arthashastra, which one of the following statements are correct? First statement goes, a person could be slave as a result of a judicial punish, pun, punishment. Let me tell you, this statement is patent statement which is correct let me tell you. The same, the same provision we did find in Dharma Shastras. Right? When I say Dharma Shastras, you call them Smritis. Based. Code, Smriti is a Sanskrit term, the English version code. Code is nothing but a set of rules and regulations. Right? Say for example, Manu Smriti, Egna Valkya Smriti, Brihaspati Smriti, Parasara Smriti, what not? We have a number of, a number of Smritis. Even Smritis also say the same provision. Thereby, the first statement is correct. Keep aside. Second statement. If a female slave bore her master a son, she was legally free. A little bit confusion, but true. So, one of the chapters which we found in Arthashastra, if a female slave bore her master, a son, she was legally free. And no doubt, we did refer as part of Arthashastra, Kautilya's Arthashastra, the slaves, be it like you know, the men are women. They suppose not to engage in production sector, right? What is it? They suppose to engage in domestic affairs. 
there is a reason one of the foreign scholars come and royal ambassador to the court of chandragupta maurya by name megasthenes he misunderstood the slavery system of mauryans and in fact the gentleman made made it clear that in mauryan mauryan society there was no slavery system at all reason being in india according to arthashastra according to smritis a little later whatever dharma shastras you talk about slaves shall not be involved in production production process you call agriculture and other stuff when when it, when it comes to like you know in europe slaves be involved in agricultural production or like you know industries and other stuff so my point is even second statement is also correct when it comes to third statement if a son born to a female slave was fathered by her master the son was entitled to the legal status of the master's son also correct so the right answer for 60th question 1 2 and 3 please one more the question is related to ancient indian history especially ashoka's major major rock edicts please and we will discuss as part of classes please based on the nature of inscriptions inscriptions were broadly divided into like you no know, three categories that is prashastis raja shasanas and dana shasanas when it comes to when it comes to ashoka's inscriptions ashoka's inscriptions popularly called as edicts let me tell you neither ashoka inscribed dana shasanas nor he inscribed the so called prashastis all ashokan inscriptions happen to be raja shasanas royal orders raja shasanas is sanskrit term the english words and royal order otherwise called as edicts the rules and regulations right so the question exclusively related to major rock edicts it's quite interesting to know let me tell you this is one of the questions which we generally found as part of history optional please a decade ago right? unless you have like you know the command over facts you can't answer this kind of questions and keeping aside command over facts by by having a little bit common sense same through elimination process we can we can answer the question that is dhauli please dhauli as we discussed the administration of mauryans the provinces the provinces of mauryans were called as deshas otherwise called as pathas Kautilya's Atharshastra says like there are four provinces, and we discussed names of the provinces and their headquarters. When it comes to Pratya Patha, we discussed as part of classes Pratya Patha, otherwise called as Eastern Province, the headquarters of Eastern Province, Dhauli, which comes in Odisha. So this is how we need to like you know answer. I need to tell you Eragudi, which comes in, which comes in Raila Sima, near Gutti. Anantapur district of Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh. Erra Gudi inscription, which talks about like you know the borders, southern borders, southern territories of Mauryans, followed by Jaugada and Kalsi. Kalsi, which comes in Uttarakhand, please. Right? And it's quite interesting. So we never found Ashoka's major rock edicts in Central India. So my point is for ninety first question, third and fourth pairs are incorrect. The right answer is first and second pair only two pairs. One more question. Right. so on one hand name of the ruler on the other hand dynasty it's it's like you know traditional way of asking questions based on when you go through previous question papers you do come across the questions names of the dynasties and their headquarters names of the prominent rulers and their prominent inscriptions now this time we have the prominent rulers on one hand on the other hand the dynasties and let me tell you the question belonged to early medieval age especially rajputs once again we discussed that is in early medieval age in north india we have 36 rajput dynasties right pratiharas paramaras chauhans chandelas now 
at least half a dozen dynasties we discussed. Let us confine to the topic that is Nannuka, yes, belonged to Chandela dynasty. Chandelas, we have referred as part of classes, class information. Chandelas were responsible for massive temple architecture. All these temples were built by Chandelas, which are located at Khajuraho. One of the patent questions which we generally get from Chandelas, Khajuraho, please. Like Nannaka, Nannuka, Nannuka, like you know, the founder you call him, the gentleman. So, one of the prominent rulers belonged to Chandelas. When it comes to Jaya Shakti, not Paramaras, please. Yes, Nagabatta II belonged to Gurjara Pratihara dynasty and when it comes to Bhoja, Bhoja belonged to a dynasty called Paramara dynasty. Right? Paramara Bhoja we call him. Right? Once again as part of Indian history we discussed that is there are four rulers in the history of India who possess the title called Kavi Raja, the king among the poets, Kavi Raja. One among them was Hala belonged to Shatavana dynasty, followed by Samudra Gupta belonged to Gupta dynasty, followed by Amogha Varsha belonged to Rashtrakuta dynasty, and followed by Paramara Bhoja belonged to Paramara dynasty. Otherwise called as Bhoja belonged to Paramara dynasty. Bhoja, one of the Sanskrit scholars, come king. We generally we generally consider him as a scholarly king. And it's quite interesting to know, uh, say for about two dozen Sanskrit books written by this gentleman. So, obviously, the right answer is 1 and 3, that is only 2 pairs. So, one more, which one of the following statements about Sangam literature in ancient South India is correct? A little bit, a little bit tricky questions. Once again, we refer as part of class notes, in post Mauryan age, in post Mauryan age, the so called power was like you know was shared, political power was shared by foreigners who are the masters of northwestern India, western India and few few parts of central India. And when it comes to North India, Deccan, Eastern India and Peninsular India, otherwise called as South India, all these territories were ruled by native rulers. Native rulers versus foreign rulers. When it comes to South India, we have Sangam. Sangam dynasties, Sangam culture, Sangam society, everything is named after Sangam. The prominent three dynasties, that is Cholas of North Tamil Nadu, Pandyas of Southern Tamil Nadu, Cheras of Malabar coast. Now, with this background, when we understand the question, the first statement, Sangam poems are devoid of any reference to material culture, absolutely incorrect. Sangam scholars produced massive literature, how Aryans produced massive literature in like you know in Vedic civilization, the Sangam literature explains various aspects of Tamil dynasties. Second one, the social classification of Varna system known to Sangam poets, the social classification of Varna system known to Sangam poets, a little bit question mark to this statement. Third one, Sangam poems, Sangam poems have no reference to warrior ethic, absolutely incorrect. They talk about ethics, rules and regulations to be followed by soldiers. Fourth one, Sangam literature refers to magical forces as irrational, as irrational, once again incorrect. Then what is, what is left that is the social classification of Varna was known to Sangam poets. No doubt, Varna system, otherwise called as Brahmanical institutions, one of the prominent Brahmanical institutions, belonged to North India, and it was in post Mauryan age the Brahmanical institutions came to Deccan and from Deccan to South India. So, the right answer for 93rd question, option B. Please. So, one more question that is 94th question. Yoga Vashistha was translated into Persian by Nizamuddin Panipati during the reign of, it is one of the like you know very general questions which we get from literature. Please. As we know, 
we have a separate term called culture lit material right? indian culture right? whenever you come across culture we have three components that is literature religion art forms and architectural forms literature and you have also learnt as part of medieval indian history there is a tradition we found in medieval indian history scholars generally take the names of the towns from they hailed for example ahmad sar hindi his name was ahmad the gentleman belonged to a town called sar hind like you know battle of sar hind and all right when it comes to the question nizamuddin the gentleman hailed from a town called panipat which comes in haryana please so panipat the first 1526 panipat the second 15 1556 panipat the third 1761 now what is the right answer the right answer is akbar right so yoga vashistha was translated into persian by nizamuddin panipat during the reign of akbar and and one of the like you know the fact which is related to the gentleman it was the gentleman by translating this book the sanskrit book trans got translated into persian and the book translated book dedicated to prince salim popularly known as jahangir prince salim popularly known as jahangir when we understand the content of yoga vashistha it's an brahmanical text the content of yoga vashistha it talks about the philosophy of philosophy of vedanta vedantic philosophy we call it now this vedantic philosophy called yoga vashistha got translated into persian by nizamuddin panipati who lived in the court of akbar and this book dedicated to prince salim one of the sons of akbar popularly known as jahangir please and the so called aspirants you shall keep in mind the maximum questions especially like you know you talk about culture you talk about history and you talk about current events and even including polity maximum questions were asked on the basis of current events the best example this question is in fact two current events questions like you know we found in the csc prelims 2022 the best example set a 95th question the question goes the world's second last the world's second tallest statue in sitting pose of ramanuja was inaugurated by the prime minister of india at hyderabad recently which one of the following statements correctly represents the teachings of ramanuja acharya please sir and let me tell you we did cover this right we have referred as part of indian history classes that is bhakti movement and sufi movements bhakti movement related to hinduism sufi movement related to islam when it comes to bhakti movement we have two sects in bhakti movement that is saguna bhakti and niguna bhakti when it comes to when it comes to like you know ramanuja acharya the gentleman belonged to saguna bhakti the one who worships god in the form please we have shankara acharya ramanuja acharya madhava acharya vallabha acharya we have we have many bhakti saints when it comes to in south india when we have north india like you know ramanand kabir nanak when it comes to deccan maharashtra we have many bhakti saints samartha ramadas eknath bhakt tukara what not please so when we confine to the question option a it's a very general question and direct question let me tell you right option a the best means of salvation was devotion devotion is an english version the sanskrit bhakti please what is meant by bhakti bhakti is nothing but self surrenderance to god devotion second statement vedas are eternal self existence and wholly authoritative when it comes to third statement logical arguments were essential means for the highest bliss absolutely incorrect when it comes to second i'm sorry fourth fourth one that is salvation was to be obtained through meditation in fact salvation was to be obtained through meditation this is like you know the statement of siddhartha gautama popularly known as gautama buddha please madhya marga and all right when talking about bhakti saints bhakti movements bhakti movement bhakti saints very simple they exclusively concentrated on bhakti the right answer is option a please very direct answer and expected answer the right answer for 95th question option a please and one more current event related to history the prime minister recently inaugurated the new circuit house near somnath temple at veraval it's the name of the place which comes in 
Gir Somnath district of Gujarat, which of the following statements are correct regarding Somnath temple? First statement, Somnath temple is one of the Jyotirlinga shrines, no doubt, correct. Second statement, a description of Somnath temple was given by Al Biruni, once again correct. And third one, Pran Pratishtha, it's a Sanskrit term, Pran Pratishtha of Somnath temple, Pran Pratishtha, the English version, installation of the present day temple was done by President Radha Krishnan, yes, it is a question mark. So, first two statements are correct with no second thought. And since third one related to current and you supposed to undergo the newspapers, means when you like you know whoever say refer newspapers definitely they would have answered based on. So, when it comes to Somnath temple, it is one of the Jyotirlingas, we have referred as part of classes, we have we have Dva Dasha. Dva Dasha Jyotirlingas, Dva, 2, Dasha, 10, 12 Jyotirlingas, one among them was Somnath temple, first statement correct. Then what is this like you know description? So as part of medieval Indian history we discussed Turkish invasions, we have two invaders and we also call them plunderers, one among them was Muhammad of Ghajni followed by Muhammad of Ghor. Muhammad of Ghazni, like traditional statement, plundered the wealth of Hindustan for about 17 times, including Somnath temple, was plundered by the gentleman Muhammad of Ghazni in the year 1025 AD. Now, these like you know recordings which we got from Al Biruni, who, who authored a book called Kitabul Hind, and it was a gentleman who came to who came to Hindustan along with Muhammad of Ghazni. So, first two statements are 100 percent correct I am talking about. When it comes to third statement, it is it is you who is supposed to undergo current events. And you can ask the question, why is why third statement are like you know incorrect? Let me tell you the third statement is incorrect because it was it was opened, the temple was opened, a reinstallation not by Dr. Sarvepalli Radha Krishnan, but Dr. by by Dr. Babu Rajendra Prasad. Rajendra Prasad. So, obviously, first and second statements only correct. Right, it is all about. So, as I was telling, like you know, we have covered, I would not say 100 percent, but like you know, the maximum 90 percent say questions are content related, we have covered. Right? So, please join us. So, we will have the break. Thank you. Please. So, we will have quickly on current affairs. So, the question is about uh, the Indian Sanitation Coalition is a platform to promote sustainable sanitation, true, and is funded by the government of India and the World Health Organization. This is not funded by the government of India. It is not funded by the government of India. It is funded by Melinda and Gates Foundation. So, little bit sanitation is a current affair. So, they asked about it. The National Institute of Urban Affairs is an apex body of the Ministry of Urban Affairs and Housing is, is one particular institution which is helping to solve the challenges of the urban problems. So, answer is two only. This first one is it is not funded by the government of India as well as the World Health Organization. It is funded by Melinda and Gates Foundation. This is one, this is wrong, this is correct statement, answer is two only. And the next is about United Nation Credential Committee. This United Nation Credential Committees are there mainly for General Assembly. It is not by United Nations Security Council 76. It is the answer is about it is a committee set up by United Nations Security Council. No, it is United Nations General Assembly. It is United Nations General Assembly. Why? Because this committee, why they asked? Because this committee want to study that whether India is suitable to become the permanent member or not, a credential committee. It is not by United Nations Security Council, by United Nations General Assembly. So, this is wrong statement. Hence, I am eliminating one. Hence, I am eliminating one. So, there is a problem with three. It assess the credentials of all UN members before submitting a report to the General Assembly. It traditionally meets in March, June and September. No, 
every year in the beginning of the United Nations General Assembly, they will be having the session. Every year once they will be having, but not. So answer is three only. A is the correct answer. A is the correct answer 76 and the next is 77. Which one of the following statements best suitable for polar code? Polar code mainly it is with respect to international code of safety for ships operating in polar waters. It is an a code while the ships are operating the safety measures which need to be taken by various country when they are moving in the north pole and south pole. This particular question was been asked with respect to polar polar code. Every year one question will be on north pole or south pole, Antarctic ocean or Arctic ocean, damn sure the question will be there. Hence, the question came on polar code which is on expected lines only. Next is United Nation General Assembly. Three questions were been asked with respect to United Nation this time. United Nation General Assembly, it is 78th question. The, the United Nation General Assembly can grant, it is about observer status to the non-members, yes, who are not members of the United Nation organization, who are, who are not the members of United Nation organization, they can also be the observers, correct. Intergovernmental organizations can seek observer status in the United Nations. Yes, they can seek, they can be observer also like intergovernmental organizations like it can be any body like it can be a World Health Organization or it can be any, any body a intergovernmental organization like SAR can also can become a mem observer status. Permanent observers in the United Nations General Assembly can, they can operate through the office of United Nations General Assembly. So, the question is about observer status. So, non-members can also become the member, first one. Non-members can also become the obser observer. Observer means not a member who is just observing, who will be participating, but who does not have power to vote are called as observer. So, non-member can also become observer. International governor, intergovernmental organization can also become an observer as well as this observer they can also this international intergovernmental organization body which are observers can also have a role with respect to yes having a body which can do their operations from United Nation headquarters. The next question is T board in India this is very interesting question T board in India the T board is a statutory body. T board is a, is a statutory body. So, answer 1, this both are wrong, 1 and 3 or 1 and 4. Then I will come to the T board head office is situated in Bangalore. No, the T board head office is located in Kolkata. So, this is also wrong. The board was overseas office at Dubai and Moscow. T board is in the news. Why? Because the T production is reducing nowadays because of which it is in the news. So, answer is 1 and 4 of 79th question. Then it is about 82nd question. This is very interesting question. Actually, I want to add the refugee camps, but because of lack of time, I could not add the images here. BDBD. BDBD is a large refugee settlement in northwestern Kenya. No, it is in Uganda. It is in Uganda. So, the first statement is wrong. Some people who fled from South Sudan civil war live in BDB. BDBD. BDBD is a very big refugee camp very big refugee camp which is located in Uganda, the South Sudan who are coming in the refugee format, they are staying in this BDBD refugee camps. Next, some people who fled from civil war in Somalia live in Dadab, Dadab refugee camp in Kenya. So, answer is 2 and 3, both are correct, 2 and 3 is yes, both are correct. So, you have to remember that there are nowadays the refugee camps are 3 are becoming very popular, one is in Myanmar. Next is in Uganda, which is called as BDBD, and third is Dadab in Kenya. In Kenya, the refugees are coming from Somalia. In BDBD of Uganda, they are coming from South Sudan. And in Myanmar, you know the story because of Rakhina Buddhist versus Rohingya Muslims. And the next is about, yes, organization of Turkic states. Organization of Turkic states. You know, Armenia cannot be, why? Because Armenia is a Christian country. So, you can one eliminate, one eliminate. So, three are remaining. Next, Croatia. Croatia are no, they are against Muslims. So, 3 cannot be there. Hence, answer is 2 and 5 that is Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. By common sense also it will become correct. Why? Because Turkic states means those states, Turkic states means those states which are high in population with respect to Muslim countries. So, but that common sense also you can come to a conclusion that 2 and 5 are correct. And the next question is United Nation Convention on the Loss of the Seas. Loss of the Seas. Yes, 
for every coastal state for every coastal state the 12 kilometers will be called as the area of the coastal state means for example if india is there if this is chennai from chennai to 12 kilometers of breadth 12 kilometers of coastal area 12 kilometers of ocean area will become the part of the indian union it will be part of indian union and up to 200 nautical miles it will become the part of indian control Ab above then the 200 nautical miles it is called as high seas there no one can claim the property over that area it is international waters so the coastal states has a right to establish the breadth of its territorial sea up to limit not exceeding 12 nautical miles measured from baseline this is correct ships of all states whether coastal or landlocked enjoy the right of innocent passage no no if for example landlocked country is there for example uh, if you take about swazi land in, uh, in in or or the best example we can take any of the country swaziland near south africa which is a landlocked country in african continent so if any movement need to happen the countries which are on the coast they will not allow their ships for swaziland so compulsory they have to take the permission innocently they will not get any permission they have to pay amount they should take some permission then only they will get accessibility of the coast so hence this statement is also wrong the exclusive economic zone shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the breadth of territorial sea is yes 200 is nautical miles as i told so 193 are correct answer c is correct these are current affairs questions which are in the news next is 86 senkaku islands between the best possible answer sometimes mentioned in the news the best possible answer is it is a conflict in east china sea conflict between the china and japan south it is generally believed that they are artificial no china and japan engage in maritime disputes over these islands in east china sea this is the correct answer why because senkaku islands are uninhabited islands which are the issues between china and japan so the b is the correct answer for this 86 and there are some 87 important reasons for being in the news 87 it is about chad setting up of permanent military base no in chad there is no military base of china false guinea suspension of constitution and government by military no new guinea is there guinea is there there lebanon severe and prolonged economic depression is going on in lebanon after sri lanka the next big economic crisis is there in lebanon tunisia suspension of parliament by the president so only two pairs are correct see current affairs oriented international events this question are been asked what are in the news this this time there is some wonder is there they are asking how many pairs are correct a new type of questions they started asking in this how many pairs are correct they are asking region after mentioned in the news antolia turkey correct amhara ethiopia correct cabo delgrado it is morocco it is morocco and catalonia is spain catalonia is spain hence how many pairs given above are correctly matching is only two pairs are correctly matching antolia correct turkey amhara correct ethiopia cabo del gado cabo del gado like our kg of 2 el dorado there is something called as cabo del gado this cabo del gado is of morocco and whereas cantolia of spain so answer only two are correct two pairs are very factual questions current affairs questions were been this 88 so totally we have current affairs questions 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 11 direct current affairs questions were been asked now we will move to the environment questions yes environment and ecology questions these are your first it is 41 climate action tracker tracker i am tracking and i am getting the data so database created by coalition of research organization it's a climate action tracker is nothing but tracking we are tracking from all the countries and we are accumulating the data of all the coalition research organizations so this is mainly with respect to which country is how much they are releasing carbon emissions which country is producing solar energy which country is good with respect to renewable energy which country is good with non renewable in that way the tracking thing was been happened under this climate climate action tracker it is a database created next the climate group 42 it is mainly which of the statements given above are correct it is mainly c i will tell you the international energy agency the secretary to under two coalition under two coalition was in the news this is wrong 
So, 5 cancelled, 5 cancelled, 5 cancelled. So, answer is B directly. If you know this one point, I know this one point. International Energy Agency is a secretary to the under 2 coalition. Under 2 coalition mainly with respect to how, how we are tracing and managing carbon emissions. So, Climate Group is an international non-profit organization that drives climate action by building large networks and runs them. Yes. Is a climate energy agency in partnership with climate group launch? No, this is wrong. EP10 brings together leading companies committed to driving innovation in energy. Yes, correct. Some Indian companies are members of EP100. No. So, answer is 235. Mainly the question is with respect to climate group and the question is about under 2 coalition. 23 international organizations were been combined with respect to climate. This is very simple. If rain, this is famous sentence. If rainforest and tropical forests are the lungs of the earth, then surely wetland functions as kidney. Which one of the following functions is best to reflect the above statement? The water cycle in wetlands involves the surface runoff, subsoil percolation and evaporation. Algae form the nutrient base upon which fish, crotazines, mollusks, birds, reptiles and mammals. Wetlands have play a vital role in maintaining sedimentation, balance and soil stabilization. Yes, mainly with respect to soil stabilization, mainly with respect to life, mainly with respect to rejuvenation, these wetlands are helpful. So, the answer is C. World Health Organization Air Quality Guidelines 44, it is very simple and direct question, it is 234. 24 hour mean to P 2.5 should not exceed 15 microgram per cubic meter and annual mean of particulate matter 2.5 should not exceed 5. This is one which is not PM 2, only one thing, it is not PM 2.5, it is PM 10. Rest all are correct and the key is there in the description as well as in the website, you can see, go through the key also 44. With reference to Gucci committee, sometimes mentioned in the news, consider the following statement 45. It is a fungus, it grows in some Himalayan forest areas, it is commercially cultivated in the Himalayan food field. No, it is naturally available. It is not commercially cultivated, it is naturally available in Himalayas. It is a fungus. It is a fungus. Next, it is with respect to 46, polyethylene terephthalate, the use of which is so widespread in our daily lives, consider the following statements 46. It is 2 and 3, containers made of it can be used to store any alcoholic beverages, bottles made of it can be recycled into other products. This is a new variety of bottles which are coming up as an alternative to plastic bottles. Polyethylene terephthalate, yes. Which of the following is not a bird? This is very important. Masher, 2019 question this is. Mahesir is a 2019 question. Mahesir means what? Fish. Which of the following is not a bird? Mahesir, 2019 previous question. Again, I am telling you, most of the questions are from previous year's questions only. No need to worry. Mahesir, 47. Fish. Mahesir means fish. Which of the following are nitrogen fixing? These are mainly alfala, chickpea, as well as clover. Yes, this is something which is in the news. Bio rock technology is talked about in which one of the following situation? Restoration of damaged coral reefs. Yes. When the coral reefs get damaged, then what type of technology we use means it is mainly with respect to bio rock technology. Bio rock technology, the Miyaki method is well known for creation of mini forests in urban areas. In Japan, they have this Miyaki. Miyaki method is mainly used to create mini forests in urban areas. In Tokyo, they follow this Miyaki method whereby urban forests are created in urban areas. Mini, mini forests are created in urban areas. Which one of the following has been constituted under Environment Protection Act 2020 question, my dear, this is prelims question 2020. They asked about Central Ground Water Authority. It is under Environment Protection Act 2020 previous question. Please cross check it. Central Ground Water Authority under Environment Protection Act, yes, 75. Which one of the following best describes the term greenwashing? 
conveying a false impression that a company's products are eco-friendly and environmentally soundly. A false impression that companies greenwashing means telling false information that our products are eco-friendly, our products are environment friendly, our products are forest friendly. So, such type of information which is providing wrongly is called as greenwashing which is 80th question. Consider the following statements, Gujarat has the largest solar park in India, no. Kerala has a fully solar powered international airport, true. Goa has the largest floating solar photovoltaic project in India. Compulsory you have to go through renewable energy and they asked about renewable energy. There will be a template for UPSC examination. One question will be from this, one question will be from, but this time only Buddhism and Jainism was been missed a little bit. With reference to Indian laws, we, about wildlife protection, I consider the following statements. Wild animals are the sole property of the government, true. When a wild animal is declared protected, such animal is entitled for equal protection whether it is found in protected areas or outside. True. Apprehension of a protected wild animal becoming danger to human life is sufficient ground for its capture or killing. No. Relocation will happen, but animal man conflict if happens, they do not have any right to kill that animal. Wrong statement. One and two is correct. A is correct answer. And the last question, 100th question. Consider the following statements, which of the above in the environment cause acid rain, expected question, acid rain, nitrogen oxide and sulphur dioxide, not carbon monoxide, not ozone. The question is about acid rain, acid rain. So, it is nitrogen oxide and sulphur dioxide, nitrogen oxide and sulphur dioxide. Yes. So, 2 and 4 nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide 100th question. So, the only science and technology is pending. Hello everyone, uh, till now we have seen all the UPSC prelims exam. I hope uh, everyone of you have written the exam very well. So, now we are going to see the questions of SNT and general science. The questions regarding th this subject are coming from the 31, let us see the question number 31. Yeah. So, if you can see the question, consider the following Arugya Setu, Kovin, Dizzy Locker and Diksha. Which of the above are built on top of open source digital platform? Here uh, we should know the meaning of this uh, term open source digital platform. What is this? It is nothing but the a platform, a digital platform which will provide access to the software code. A, co uh, a source code, that code can be made enabled for all of the users and also the information provided under these platforms can be made available by, uh, for the users. So, if you can see the initiatives of government of India and also other initiatives of India, if you can study those, the Arugya Setu, a mobile app which can uh, provide information for the uh, COVID-19 vaccination and uh, pre-information will be provided under this app and recently it was made the open source digital platform. And also the COVID, COVID is also a, a mobile app which, uh, which will also provide some information regarding the disease. And also the disease locker, we have uh, a very much information uh, regarding the disease locker. It is the digital platform created by the government of India to save the documents uh, uh, electronically. It is that platform and regarding the Diksha, it is the teacher training platform and all these platforms were recently made open source digital platforms. So, the answer for this question is D. Okay, now let us see the next question. That is with reference to web 3.0 consider the following statements. What is the web 3.0 here? The web 3.0 is nothing but a developed and more developed uh, web platform which can have different types of features. Till now we have web 1.0 and 2.0. Right now we are using in a wide range the web 2.0. It is nothing but a web browser, a web network which, were, which we are using till now. And now the developed version uh, is having enables people to control their own data. 
yes it enables and in web 3.0 world they can be blockchain based social networks this network of course will definitely work based on the blockchain uh, network and the web 3.0 is operated by users collectively rather than a corporation it is a it is the well developed feature under the web 3.0 why because the users can work on the web 3.0 rather than a corporation so hence the answer for this question is again the d 1 2 and 3 okay now let us see next question it is nothing but with reference to software as a service consider the following statements okay it is nothing but a licensing model okay under this it is nothing but a licensing model under this if any any features like file sharing like calendar and all those features can be enabled under this platform okay saas buyers can customize the user interface and can change data fields before analyzing this statement let us see the features of the saas saas is nothing but the software as a service uh, as, as a service system okay so the users can access their data it is the correct one and through their mobile devices it is nothing but accepting some softwares like including uh, transferring the files and calendars and all those uh, mechanic uh, systems under the softwares can be enabled under this system but one of the drawback one of the biggest drawback of this system is nothing but this it cannot enable the users to customize the saas so hence this statement is wrong okay a few examples for this are outlook uh, outlook hotmail and yahoo mail are the best examples of saas it is also hence it is also correct these two statements are correct and this is the wrong one so what can uh, what can be the answer we have to identify the correct one so the option is the 2 and 3 only right so it is this question now let us see the next question which one of the following statements best reflects it is best reflects the idea behind the fractional orbital bombardment system often talked about in media here we have to know the concept fractional orbital bombardment system what is this it is nothing but placing an object in in one orbit and um, uh, and we have to make it to enact on its bombardment on the surface and also if you can see the uh, word here fractional it works on the uh, based on the fractions of the orbit that is the important feature of this mechanism so the object which is uh, put under the orbit around the surface around the earth surface then it will uh, travel on that orbit a fraction of that orbit and it will bombard any object on the surface so it is the main concept of this uh, a uh, fractional orbital bombardment system so if you can see the answers uh, the answer for this is this why because it is the ma main meaning definition of this uh, concept a missile is put into a stable orbit around the earth and de orbits over a target on the earth okay so it will target any object on the surface so uh, from that orbit so a missile will be put in the a stable orbit around the surface of the earth okay so the c is the answer for this question let us move on to the next question that is regarding the which one, which one of the following is the context in which the term qubit is mentioned it is the very basic question why because qubit is related with the quantum com computing it is the short form of quantum bit that is nothing but the qubit it is the short form of the quantum bit so so hence it is the basic unit the quantum bit is the basic unit of the uh, process quantum computing we have the uh, binary uh, bits uh, in computing technologies right so under the quantum computing the qubit will work as a basic unit so that to 
enable and also to transfer the data in the form of the qubits. That is the very basic question. You can you could have answered very easily this question. Now let us see next question. Consider the following communication technologies. It is also of very basic question mark. Okay, if you can consider the statements: closed circuit television, radio frequency identification, wireless local area network. All these uh, technologies will use the short range devices technologies. It is very fact, fact oriented factual question. Why? Because all these technologies will use the short range devices, short range uh, uh, waves. Okay, based on this short range uh, uh, waves, these technologies will work. The wireless area, local area network, an example for this could be the Bluetooth, which we use of very often. And also the radio frequency identification, it can also work under the short range and also closed circuit televisions. So hence, the answer for this is the D. Okay. Now, let us see the next question. Consider the following statements regarding the biofilms. Okay. What are the biofilms? If you have any basic idea regarding the biofilms, it is very easy for you to answer. Biofilms can form on medical implants within human tissues. First, first let's, uh, let, let me tell you the meaning of the biofilm. What are the biofilms? Biofilms are the nothing but any single layer formed on any surface. A single layer of microbes. Okay a single thin layer of microbes that can be formed on any surface. Here we have to define what could be those surfaces. If you can, in, uh, if you can identify any plaque on our teeth, okay, any microbial uh, spread on our teeth can also be a biofilm. So hence now we can understand the meaning of the biofilm. It is nothing but, uh, uh, nothing but a single layer that can be formed by the microbes on any surface. Okay, so now let us see the statements. Biofilms can form on medical implants within human tissues. Yes, yes it is correct. Why? Because in recent cases as in some heart implants or any bone implants, the biofilms, the, infec uh, the infection of biofilms were uh, noticed in recent cases. Hence, it is the right statement. And also biofilms can form on food and food processing surfaces. Yes, of course, it can also be correct. Uh, you can use your common sense here. Why? Because the food and food processing surfaces, as there is a, a very high amount of food available there, the infection of microbes on those surfaces will be most possible. So, hence, this statement is also correct. And biofilms can exhibit antibiotic resistance. Here you have some information, background information regarding this. Sometimes, in many cases also, biofilms shows the antibiotic resistance. Here, what is the antibiotic resistance? Showing some resistance against antibiotic. So, hence, even if we use antibiotics against those microbes, they will not get killed. Right. So, hence, this statement is also the correct one. Now, the answer for this is the D. 1, 2 and 3. Clear? Now, let us move on to the next topic. That is, consider the following statements in respect of probiotics. It is also the very basic uh, term. If you have studied this general science at your basic levels, you could have answered this question. What are the bio probiotics? Probiotics are nothing but those uh, components produced by the friendly microbes. Okay. What are these friendly microbes? Those are present in our gut. Okay, gut of humans or animals. Okay, in our in our digestive system, in our guts, uh, we have our friendly microbes. Okay, friendly microbes will produce these probiotics. They will uh, 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 they will act as enzymes in the digestion of some uh, types of food particles. Okay, now let us see the uh, statements. The statement one reads as. Probiotics are made of both bacteria and yeast. Yes, it is correct. Why? Because here I am using the word microbe, not only the bacteria. Hence, these are the friendly microbes which consists of bacteria as well as the fungi. 
East is nothing but the fungi, right? Okay. So, the second statement reads as the organisms in probiotics are found in foods we ingest, but they do not naturally occur in our gut. Now, you should be in a state to answer this. It states that they do not present in our gut naturally. It is wrong. Why? Because these friendly bacteria are naturally present in our gut. We do not uh, inject uh, those microbes to install them in our gut. They are naturally present in our uh, digestive system. So, this statement is wrong. And the probiotics help in the digestion of milk and sugars. Of course, it is correct. They will help in digestion of any, any hard particles. Even in some cases, the probiotic, the role of probiotics is also found in the digestion of the lactose that is present in the milk. So, hence this statement is also the correct one. So, the, uh, the answer for this is 1 and 3. You have to identify the correct, uh, correct option, right? So, the answer for this is 1 and 3. Statement 1 and 3. Clear? Now, let us see the next question. That is regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. In my classes, I have uh, told you several times uh, to study uh, completely and uh, to research on the COVID-19 related topics. And here we got the, that question. Okay. In the context of vaccines manufactured to prevent COVID-19 pandemic, consider the following statements. Okay. The Serum Institute of India produced COVID-19 vaccine named Covishield using mRNA platform. Now let us analyze this statement. It is regarding the Covishield. What is the Covishield? Covishield is a vaccine that is developed by the Oxford University and AstraZeneca. You know all those uh, factual things, right? Uh, the Oxford University along with the AstraZeneca has developed the Covishield vaccine and it is, it is manufactured locally in India by the Serum Institute of India. Okay? So, hence it is correct. Serum Institute of India produces the Covishield. Now, let us uh, analyze whether it is the mRNA vaccine. Is it? It is not. Why? Because Covishield is the vector based vector based vaccine. Now, let us see what is the vector based. Vector based is nothing but uh, the scientist will use uh, any virus as a vector. They will take any other virus as a vector. Okay. So, into that it is, uh, uh, it will be another virus, not the COVID-19 virus. It will be another. In this case, they have taken the adenovirus adenovirus as vector. Okay. The scientist initially will take the virus as a vector. He, he, here in this case, they, they took uh, uh, adenovirus as the virus uh, vector. Now, into its genetic material, some part of the genetic material of COVID, uh, COVID virus will be inserted into this virus by using the genetic material principles, the genetic engineering principles. Okay. So, hence like that a, a tiny small part that uh, can encode the production of the spike protein. The COVID-19 uh, virus will have spike protein. We know that there will be some fragment of genetic material present in that COVID virus which can encode the sp uh, spike protein, right? So, that part of the genetic material will be taken off and it will be inserted into the genetic material of the viral vector. Here in this case, our example is the adenovirus. Now, our viral vector is ready, is made ready, but it is of course harmless. It will not cause any disease in the human. Okay. Now, it will be developed as a vaccine and it will be injected into the humans. Now, here what happens? The genetic material that is present in the virus will get into the humans and it will activate the cells of the human so that to produce and develop the spike proteins. So, hence now it will develop the spike proteins in the human, right? Then the immune system, the immune system that is present in the humans will get activated. So, hence some memory cells that are present in the body will be get ready to 
act against this spike protein. So, this system will be done by the vaccination of these viral based vaccines. Now, this uh, human, this human will be ready and, ha and having some memory cells of his immune system whenever the real virus, the real COVID virus will be infected into that human, those memory cells which are present in that human will immediately enact, immediately act against that COVID virus. So, this is the concept behind the vector based vaccines. So, hence here the statement is wrong. The COVID shield, COVID shield using mRNA platform is wrong, but it is of vector based vaccine. Okay. Now, let us see the second statement. The Sputnik V vaccine is manufactured using vector based platform. It is correct. Why? Because it is also developed using the same concept, but by the Russian. Russian scientists. Okay. Hence, this statement is correct and the co-vaccine is an inactivated pathogen based vaccine. Of course, it is also correct. Uh, here, here also there is a huge concept behind this. The actual COVID-19 virus will be taken here and it is inactivated by, by allowing it to, to some chemicals or heat actions by using all these this virus this covid 19 actual covid 19 virus will be inactivated okay so after that the vaccine will be developed and it will be injected to the human okay that is the concept behind this and it is also correct so hence the answer for this is the two and three statements we have to identify the correct one. The option B is the answer for this. Clear? And also the mRNA mechanism. It is also the another concept. Here the mRNA will be developed using some genetic material of the virus. So that uh, that is also responsible to produce some spike protein. And using this mRNA, it will be inserted into the host genetic material so that this cell, this host cell will be, will get that capacity to generate some spike protein. After that, the same mechanism, the immune activity will get activated. Here, we are using the genetic material of the virus in this concept, vector based vaccine. In mRNA technique, we are using the mRNA, messenger RNA as a uh, base for this concept to develop the uh, such a vaccines. Okay, so this is all about this regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, let us see the next question that is regarding the solar storm. Okay, it is uh, tricky. Why? Because it is a lengthy question. People might have got uh, uh, frightened uh, seeing questions like this. But if you have studied patiently, you can answer this question very easily. If a major solar storm, solar flare reaches the earth, which of the following are the possible effects on the earth? First statement, C. Solar flares are uh, very harsh radiations that are coming from the sun onto the earth. That, uh, that, uh, that will never occur in present times. But if that happens, it will alter the entire environmental mechanisms and systems and the balance of the earth. So, the entire radiations will get occurred and deformed. The GPS navigation system could fail. And tsunamis could occur at equatorial regions, of course. Okay, the entire gravitational forces, entire mechanisms, the entire forces of the earth will get affected by such a storms, solar storms. And also power grids could be damaged, of course. They are also work under based on the uh, radiations that are coming from the sources. And also intense auroras could occur over much of the earth. They can also be formed and forest fires, of course, the fires will be occurred. Why? Because the temperatures of the earth will be increased a lot. Okay. And also orbits of the satellites could be disturbed, of course. Why? Because they work based on the signals coming from the earth's surface to their orbits. They can be disturbed by this why because the intense radiations from solar storm will be uh, will be focused on the earth's surface they will be disturbed 
and the short wave radio communications of the aircraft flying over polar regions could be also interrupted. So, all these can happen. So, hence the option answer for this is D 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Okay, now let us see the next question. It is very simple, simple and tiny question and very cute question I would say. Why? Because it is regarding the fungi and insect symbiosis. If you have the knowledge of the concept symbiosis between two types of species, it there is there occurs a beautiful form of symbiosis between fungi and insects especially between fungi and ant. So, certain species of uh, which one of the following organisms are well known as cultivators of fungi. Why? Because as the ants can form symbiosis with, fu with fungi, they can also be called as cultivators of fungi. So, hence the answer for this question would be A. Okay, now let us see the next question. Which one of the following statements best describes the role of B cells and T cells in the human body? I would say this uh, this can be considered as a disputable, a little disputable question. Why? Because more than one option are seeming like an answer for this question. Why? Because the T cells and B cells would uh, would create this uh, resistance. They protect the body from the disease caused by pathogens, it can be correct. And also if you can see the first option, they protect the body from environmental allergens, that can also be occur. If we, if we can consider any sneezes or any uh, uh, like allergic reactions in our body, that will be majorly caused by these uh, uh, immune responses. And also if we can consider any T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells, they can be called as T reg cells. These are a subgroup of the T cells. If we can consider them, they also work as immunosuppressants. So, hence I would say this uh, as a some dispu disputable question, but I would say the answer could be A or D. Okay, let us see, uh, let us wait for the UPSC key. And uh, let us see the answer for this. So, why, why because the T reg, the T regulatory cells would also actively participate in this mechanism and also in this mechanism and they are, uh, they are the subgroups of the T cells. But the question says that uh, the best describes the role of B cells and T cells. Okay, do not get confused, but answer could be A or D. Okay, now let us see the next question. Consider the following statements. Other than those made by humans, nanoparticles do not exist in nature. Now, let us see what are the nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are nothing but a very small tiny particles which uh, whose size will range uh, bit, uh, till the nanometers, okay, 0 0.0009, okay. So, they, they occur, they also occur naturally in the environment. Hence, this statement is wrong. Apart from the human made uh, nanoparticles, they are also naturally occur while, uh, while the uh, from the volcanoes, they will be uh, they will be produced and developed from the volcanoes as well. So, hence there are so many examples for nano, uh, nanoparticles which exist naturally in the environment. So, hence this statement is wrong and the nanoparticles of some metallic oxides are used in the manufacture of some cosmetics. Yes, it is correct why because some zinc oxides okay, and magnesium arsenic oxides, all these metallic oxides are very widely used in cosmetic products in the form of nanoparticles. Hence, this statement is correct and also nanoparticles of some commercial products which enter the environment are unsafe for humans. Of course, nanoparticles are unsafe for humans. In recent uh, news also nanoparticles are found in the blood streams of the humans as well. So, hence and also uh, while breathing uh, some asthma or breathing uh, disturbances uh, can also be occurred by the nano, uh, pollution of nanoparticles. So, they are unsafe for humans. So, the answer for this can be 2 and 3 D. Okay. 
Now let us see the next question. Consider the following statements regarding the DNA barcoding can be a tool to. What is the DNA barcoding? DNA uh, is nothing but barcoding is nothing but creating some uh, map of the DNA fragment. If we can consider any uh, any microbe, okay, if that uh, if the DNA of that microbe is previously mapped, okay, we have this information with us already. Now we have to identify some contaminant of this microbe in some food. It is the past scenario. Now we have to identify this contaminant uh, microbe in food. So now the that DNA of this microbe will be mapped again to identify this contamination. Now these two will be matched. If they get matched, then the uh, scientist would say this microbe is contaminated in that in that food item. So it is nothing but the simply the principle of the DNA barcoding, just matching the DNA sequence of uh, one micro with uh, already mapped DNA sequence. Okay, now let us see the uh, statements. Assess the age of a plant or animal. It it is wrong. Why? Because even if the DNA in all the information of DNA, we cannot uh, say and analyze the age of that uh, living organism. That is the very basic thing. So hence, even uh, so, by the by using the DNA barcoding as well, we cannot uh, assess the age of any plant or animal. Okay. So and the second statement is distinguish among species that look alike. Of course, why? Because here, while using this, uh, if any another microbe we we are researching on any another microbe, they look like uh, same physically, but if we can uh, do this type of DNA mapping, if they does not match uh, with each other, we can say they are not the same. We can easily identify the difference between them by using the mechanism DNA barcoding. And also identify undesirable anim animal or plant materials in processed food. It is the example, it is the very uh, proper example for this statement. Okay. So hence, these two statements are correct. Uh, so, we have to identify the correct one. The answer for this is the D. Okay. With this, I completed the discussion of all the SNT and general science questions. Uh, so, here uh, we will end our discussion uh, with our life. Uh, we hope uh, we have completed the analysis of all the 100 questions coming under the all the subjects with all our subject experts. So, uh, here the discussion of all the SNT questions. Thank you.